we want to call on all here to that at the very least, you should be allowed to travel out of Abuja to go home and do the needful with regards to the burial of his younger brother. In the absence of their father who has been deceased for a while, he stands in the role of the father of that family. And so we urge you all to call on government to ensure this as a minimum. Thank you. Nimbo. Yes. Hello. Yes. Nimbo Lenjilo. Allow look on me. Allow look on me. Nimbo Lenjilo. Shag, when somebody is talking, please mute that person. Omo yele show, right? Yes, please. Unmute. Shag will mute him. Unmute him. Yes, go ahead. It's so painful to, to, to lose somebody to call brother. But Olaji Deshore is speaking to us right now with the life he lived. He's an angel telling us that we should not relent in our effort to stop this incessant killing in Nigeria. And I pray almighty God to strengthen you and the entire family and friends so that it grants you positive to bear this painful loss. And I'm calling on all Nigerians to please Stand up this time around. Let's put end to this killing once and for all. Our legislators are just there for doing nothing. They are seeing all these things happening every day and night. Our people are being killed. Innocent people are being killed. And they're doing nothing. This is the right time now for them to do something. We need to remove this terrorist in chief from office so that people can move freely in Nigeria. Please accept my condolence. Aluta continua Victoria Aceta. We won't be able to take everyone, but I will exercise patience. Ogunlaya Lawrence, Ogunlaya Lawrence. If you want to say, as been said by a previous speaker, please no need. Good evening, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay, can I can I go ahead? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir, for the opportunity given to me. Egmon Omoyeleshore, when I heard about the incident yesterday, I was highly devastated. I was so pained. And one thing that gets to my mind is, is this incident not going to stop the struggle? Because I know this hodge to quit. Even the, 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 the military guys, the generals also felt that hodge at some time when they were coming, maybe as a cadet or so. And when that thing happened, I said, oh my goodness. Is Mr. Moy really sure not going to have this kind of urge to quit this struggle? Because for the past um, early this year, I have seen the narration and the mentality in the minds of the youth changing. So when you started this struggle before the election, so many of us, so many of the youth, not me, not inclusive, did not understand your part. Some were talking, this, saying that, but recently I see that people begin to love you. People begin to get the message so clear. And such a thing that happened yesterday. I saw when I, whenever you post anything, I read comments and I see what people are saying now. It's changing from when you started. That shows 
that your message, your ideology, what you are doing is getting to the mind of people. This is not the time to quit, sir. It is so sad. It is so sad. Please, sir, just accept my condolence. May the Lord Almighty be with you, uphold you, be with the entire family. And such a thing will never happen again in your family. And I bless Nigeria with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Professor Yeni Yibukola. Oyeni Yibukola. Unmute him, please. Oyeni Yibukola, you can talk. Unmute him. Okay. Hello, Mr. Sowure. I've lost younger ones before, so I know how it feels. It's quite unfortunate. I want you to put one thing at the back of your mind. God gives and it takes away. Nobody can console you. It's only you that you can console yourself. I lost this, a younger one at point of delivery. I lost three like that. So I know how bitter it is. But sir, this is what I want to tell you. After everything is said and done, it will remain only you. Hold fast to that which you believe. Remember that young man, what he has in mind, what dream he had in mind, and what he will want you to do. Please, sir, that's the only thing that will uphold you. I've always known you right from our announced days during military era. So I know who you are. I know how strong you are. And I'm not perturbed. I know this will not discourage you. I salute you. And I will always keep you in my prayers. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Mwoke, Mwokeji Beckley. Please unmute them very quickly so that we can save time. Please go ahead, Professor Mwokeji. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Fulala, uh, Brother Yele. Um, I was shocked when I had this, uh, but at a certain level, it wasn't uh, totally unexpected that uh, because they shot at you, they've jailed you, they've done everything. And that uh, uh, we, when something like this happens, we suspect the worst, okay? And uh, uh, my heart and the heart of my family goes out to your family and I, yeah, I'm sure that this expresses the view of most Nigerians and the view of most of the world that is engaged in Nigerian affairs. And, um, and, uh, and the fact that you're still here today with us on this forum, in spite of what happened, showed that you you are made of steel, you are unbreakable. Yes. And that is uh, something that gives us, you know, more hope, encourages us and everybody. Uh, when, uh, and even shows to the enemy that you are unbreakable, okay? Uh, so this is very good to have you here today, in spite of all this. And this calls for, for reflection. And um, I have to talk back to what Dr. Mal Mal Malafia said. How long is it going to continue? Now, the people who killed your brother have been killing people, we know that. But they are now what people have started regarding as a government militia, okay? And this government has an enormous database at the disposal of what people are at any given time, what people are doing. Um, that if this is, you know, if this is something deliberate, what the rest of us will be asking and what we will insist on asking is, uh, to be to, for for us for it to be explained to us why this should happen, why this should happen, because uh, if 
it is an access nation, then it is at a whole new level. Even if it is just random Fulani Hatsman murder, it is still troublesome. It highlights the problem that Nigerians face every day. So this is really, really a time of reflection and a time to raise this game, to know what we are facing. So this is just uh, my contribution to this. So we have to begin to think more clearly that this thing is coming home. None of us is safe. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wokeji. Olivia's iPhone. Olivia, please be very brief. Do not repeat what somebody has said before, please. Don't repeat, please. Go ahead. Um, I greet my, um, I greet my comrade, my senior comrade, comrade Omayole Shore. My name is Michael Bakari. I'm one of his sons and I'm talking from Lagos. I, um, I just want to say to you, sir, that, um, you are hurricane. You are third force. You are unbreakable and nothing shall break you. And do not forget also that there is no wind that will blow in the favor of a ship with a destination. So all that you're doing right now is one of the prizes that the people before you, like Mandela, Nelson, the prizes that they pay with their lifespan span and incarceration is the same thing the same path you've chosen. And I can guarantee you, sir, with all optimism, that you will only win. And together we shall win. And nothing shall break you. I love you. I always love you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Idol, the great poet, the Ghanaian, the former program officer for Ford in Lagos, Trust Africa. Thanks for joining us. You're a very famous man. Question. Thank you very much. Uh, my dearest brother, this is sad. I just want to share with you the concept of humanity, of who we are as humans among the Akan people of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. As some yeah. way of handling this sad, sad loss. Everybody, yeah, everybody go ahead. So the world. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 Yes, I I got muted, but the Akan people of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have a concept of people, human beings, that I think will help in dealing with the sad, sad loss of your beloved brother. According to the Akan people, we as humans have three parts. We have our body, that's called the Hunam, and the body is given to us by our parents which is why often we look like them, or at least one of them. The second part is the soul of the person. It's our soul. And the soul is given by Onyankopong, the almighty God, and that never dies. It goes back. It is the body that dies. And the third part, is called Nkrabia, and Nkrabia is the legacy of the person, what the person does on earth. And that is a divine social contract. We sign with the Almighty before we are born. And so the Nkrabia never dies, it's what's left behind. And I think just from listening to 
those who have spoken today, and this one hour of focus on your bereavement, clearly your brother has left behind a huge unforgettable legacy. So let's keep going with it. Let's keep his legacy alive forever. Thank you. I'm with you. Thank you. Well, can I please um, plead? Because 11 other people want to talk. Can I crave your indulgence? Appeal to you for forgiveness? Because I won't be able to take all of you. So let me just limit the number that I want to take to only the woman. So can we retire all the men who want to talk and just take only the woman, please? Forgive me. We've spent one hour. I crave your indulgence, please. Only the woman should stay behind. Doris Ikeri, Doris, please. Thank you very much, sir, um, for the opportunity. I want to say this to my leader, um, it's really painful and sad what happened from uh, South Africa. We, the Take It Back members, we condole with you because I know it's a difficult time, but I just want to assure you that you are not alone. We are standing solidly behind you and we are looking forward that the perpetrators of this evil act will be brought to book and the, the Buhari administration will be made to pay for his evil sins. Once again, be strong as you have always been and keep the spirits. Thank you. Edit. Edit. Go ahead, please. Unmute, edit. Edit, please. Go ahead. Unmute, edit. Edit, unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling me, sir. Mr. Shore, you know how much I appreciate you, sir, for your good work, your fight for a better Nigeria. May God continue to be your strength and your shield, sir. You are doing a great job. Please, let this continue to be strong. Don't let this weigh you down. We will surely overcome. The injustice in Nigeria will be over. God is with us. God is with you, and we are with you. Accept my condolence, sir. Please, take heart. Thank you, Edith. Professor Lauren Toba from um, Adekunle Jassy University, I recognize you. Please go ahead, ma. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma. Thank Can you very you. much for recognizing me. Comrade Shore, my heartfelt condolences uh, on the, what I would call the state murder and I'll define it of your brother. Um, a state that refuses to protect her citizens must be held responsible and accountable for the kind of death that your brother died. And as many others as died that way, we must begin to make the state account for their deaths. We must insist that the state is murdering Nigerians. And we must insist that the state has to pay for the death of these people that are being daily killed. It's coming to our doorsteps. And we cannot feign ignorance anymore. We cannot pretend not to be concerned. We can't wait until it is our own family members anymore. 
it's unfortunate that some of the things that you had been agitating over, that you are now a double victim of it. My heart is with you. My heart is with your entire family. But I want to encourage you. I want to remind you that evil has never triumphed and will never triumph over good. And that you should therefore not be deterred. I want to tell you today that a movement will rise, whether they like it or not. It's going to be irrepressible. It's going to be unstoppable. But evil will crawl on its knees. Justice, fair play, good governance will be established in Nigeria, whether our leaders like it or not. So comrades, once again, my condolences to you and to the family at large. Be strengthened. Be strengthened. Aluta continua Victoria Asata. Thank you. Oludare Ogunlana. Oludare. Oludare. Are you there? Adelekan, Adelekan. Adelekan, please. Thank you, Daddy. Oh, we are uh, taking only women, please. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Go Daddy, ahead. I have something important to quickly share. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Baba Show, condolences, sir. Uh, quickly, I want us all to know that GD has left legacy behind. Today we are talking about GD, his foundation. What are we also preparing to leave behind? That is one. The number two is this. We don't know how far this is going. We don't know when this is going to end. If you have any opportunity to lay your hand on something you can use to protect yourself, not to fight anyone, especially people back home, please do whatever you can to protect yourself. We all deserve to live and not to die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally, Yene Ungo. Yene Ungo, please. Thank you. This is going to be. Please go ahead. Please unmute Thank her. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I um, appreciate that you have given me opportunity to speak and say some words to um, my good and important comrade there, Brother Sawari, I, um, I offer you not only condolences here from the US, um, I want you and all of our family and comrades to know that we are here, here in the belly of the beast that drives so much of what is being fought. We are here continuing to fight with you. We fight knowing that we have responsibility across all of our all of our communities being here in the seat of imperialism in the place that empowers all of the other spaces in which these kinds of atrocities are um, being uh, acted out um, against our people for the benefit of the um, the ruling class. Um, so I want you to know that you that the that your that your trauma and that what you have gone through is being um, seen all over, including here, that your comrades are here across the globe and that we are all fighting. We know that the only way that these atrocities ends is for all of us, the people, to actually rise up. And so we cannot allow these things to continue to happen. We cannot wait for any of these state actors to become accountable to us. We have to enact the justice, we have to enact the accountability, we have to enact the peace, we have to enact the transformation. We are the ones who are, have to do it and we understand that and you are not alone. We are all, many of us are putting ourselves out here in order to, um, to, be, to be with you, including the uh, potential um, backlash that comes from having the will to fight. But we we are fighting as well 
and we will all come together across this globe in order to um, to to right these wrongs and to protect our fellow family from these wrongs in the future. Condolences to you. We'll continue to fight with you, alongside you. Our spirits are together, even though we are seas away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for this one hour ceremony in honor of our late brother. Uh, may God receive him and console the family. I now want to move to the interview session. The format has changed. We will be lenient on him. The questions were supposed to be extremely tough, but we'll be lenient on him. Let me start with the first question. The death of your brother, kidnapping ceremonies, banditry, Boko Haram, all of them. How do we reconcile this with the big social parties? Obi Kubana's barrier, Buhari's um, son's marriage ceremony, I'm sure you have been to Victoria Island and the Koyi Muslim Center, like me, attending marriages, thousands of people, the efficiency to deliver the food and the drinks. How do we reconcile, on the one hand, these killings with elaborate social events in Nigeria? That will be my first question. Unmute yourself. We have to. You are muted. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for bringing me on your platform. Uh, thanks to everyone who spoke glowingly about uh, the pain of my family. Uh, the uh, described as state mother. Uh, this kind of murder has uh, two levels or two suspects. The first, uh, the primary murderers, and that one you can bet uh, is the state, and we know them. The secondary murderers are the people we have not found, and those are people who are acting on behalf of the Nigerian state to do what happened. Uh, to my younger brother today. I also want to make something open today that um, I am the first child of my family. We have about 16 siblings. I'm the number one. He's number second. I used to be the shield over everybody, but since I was held up here in Abuja to ransom, kidnapped from Lagos, August 3rd, 2019, and eventually kept in open prison here in Abuja. The pressure on my brother to cater for the younger ones was what led him to be driving around twice between school and his businesses on that very dangerous road. Otherwise, I don't think my brother would be on the road at 6 a.m. I did not be that he was under pressure to cater you know, for our younger ones and the needs of the family. So he automatically became the breadwinner of our huge family unprepared and he discharged his duties creditably well and i'm sure wherever he is if he's hearing us he'll be uh resting uh and also happy and also i won't find anything about him he said the reason i decided to come here today is uh, this is what my brother would do is uh if this happened uh to someone else in the family or uh, if this will stand in the way of an important assignment, you say, go and do it. You know, just leave us alone. Uh, we'll take care of ourselves. So that is the reason why I'm here today to honor his free spirit and his resilience uh, as a child who, who, when he was a little boy, was referred to as daddy. 
in the house because he was the most respected, the most loved, and the one who made everybody happy. So having said that, I got your question. Uh, the Nigerian state itself uh, is riddled with uh, internal contradictions. And these contradictions are multi-level and multi-layered. Uh, some of them you can explain uh, within sociology, some you can explain within uh, the realm of religion, some you can explain within the realm of just keeping hope alive. And while you see young people embrace some of the most ridiculous social means of engaging and interacting with themselves, uh, while I get upset sometimes, I just understand that they have been beaten so badly, you know, every day. They never had a great life. They didn't have a government, no social security safety net. They have to fend for themselves. Uh, and it's just human to find a social outlet to just make yourself a little bit happy uh, when you are a Nigerian and you have had 60 years of unbroken record of abuse in the hands of sub, you know, uh, of leaders that have been on the national stage. So that's what you see and what you call parties. The other layer of it is to complete, complete political distraction too. Uh, it's social political distraction, as I like to call it. The government does also allow some things to just strive so that the young people or old people will not have the presence of mind to pay attention to social political issues that's is destroying their lives. It used to happen in the Congo when Mobutu Sese Seko was in power. There was uh, this legion that when the economy wasn't working and there were no jobs, he figured out how to distract people's attention by subsidizing beer. And that was uh, what kept everybody busy and drinking all the time. Uh, you know when you get drunk, the next thing you do, and you never think about who is the leader of the country. You look at it also, why are we so, some of the most religious countries in the world, but we have some of the most wicked people it's also part of distraction, religion, social activities, sports, betting, uh, all these things are, are, are reasons why the Nigerian society is the way it is. But there's also another layer to it, you know, uh, that Nigerians as a people are unique, uh, unique in a special way. They have what has been described as a cannabis gene. It's a gene that is peculiar to Nigerians. It is the reason why we are the most happy, we are the happiest people on earth, even though we live the most miserable life. Nothing can explain why we are like that, except there's a gene sitting down somewhere at the bottom of our anatomy that has made it possible for us to be happy or find a way to be happy, even though we live in misery. Uh, so the rest of it um, are things that I guess we will have to talk about uh, at a special convocation of this kind of event, uh, Professor. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Thank you. I would like to call on Ms. Bijoke Faborode, who will lead um, the first segment of the interview. Uh, she's a co founder and executive director of Elect Her a non-partisan pan-African political organization that is committed to increasing women's political leadership. She's a passionate social innovator. She deals with issues of inequality and poverty in Africa. And she's been very prominent in the democracy and culture movement. Ms. Biyoke Faborode, welcome. Um, hello, Professor. Sorry. Good morning. Um, unfortunately, she has some technical issues, so she cannot, uh, she had to leave the call. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let us know when she's back. Then I'll come, Moses Ochonu. Uh, Professor Moses Ochonu is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair in History. Professor of African History, 
He completed his PhD at the University of Michigan, uh, and he also did a graduate certificate in conflict management. He's a well-known author of major books, African Fragments, Colonialism by Proxy, Aousa Imperial Agents, uh, Colonial Meltdown, Northern Nigeria and the Great Depression, Entrepreneurship in African History, and his forthcoming book, Emirs in London. Welcome, Professor Chun. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Falola. Uh, and uh, it's, it's sad that we are encountering one another in these uh, tragic circumstances. Shawere, we've come a long way, but uh, I've always admired your courage, you know that. We've had multiple encounters, you've always had my support, we've uh, communicated. Um, what happened yesterday was the last thing that I wanted to hear regarding you. I've uh, followed your travel in the hands of the, um, the current regime. And I've always hoped that somehow you paying the price and you um, suffering, I would say on our behalf, would lead to more cheerful news. But, you know, as they say, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. So please accept my condolences, and I hope to see you in person to encourage you, but stay strong. So my first question, uh, you for some time now have been pushing for revolution. Your, in fact, your slogan is revolution now, and you have uh, ad, uh, put together a coalition to push this agenda of revolution now. My question is uh, multi-layered. Why do you think that a revolution is necessary in Nigeria? And why do you think that it is possible to have a revolution given the multiple divergent agendas of different ethnic and regional and even religious groupings in Nigeria? That would be my first question. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Chen, and it's also great to see you after a prolonged period of, after a prolonged hiatus, right? Uh, I um, have looked at Nigeria 60 years of existence and participated actively for 30 years in Nigeria's lifespan and as an independent nation, having started around 1989 as a student of the University of Lagos. And all these years have convinced me that nothing at the level of uh, reforms, nothing at the level of superficial innovations, nothing at the level of interventions that are very, very conventional can change the trajectory of the Nigerian nation i'm uh, sorry i don't like to call it nation i like to call it country except we drop everything we've been doing which is wrong and we know it and turn around and clean the organ stable that's known as nigeria and create brand new systems created by brand new people brand new ideas and that there is no way it will be possible to have an omelet without breaking the egg as far as the Nigerian situation is concerned. That was that conclusion I had. I came to that final conclusion. I had it, I had it full circle by 2010 when I ran for office as president, traveled 34 states out of the 36 states and the federal capital territory and spoke to people and understood that there was, there's no Nigerian state. It is just a collection of rogue elements, rogue societies, groups, organizations. It's a collection of organized criminals, you know, 
who are just running the country to their own advantages, using proxies, using armies, using agencies, and using, you know, sometimes it is just hypnotizing people that's keeping Nigeria together. To your second question about why do I think it's possible, it is rooted in research, Professor, uh, that if 6% of any population of a country can be convinced or convince itself that there is need for radical change, that change will start and happen. So it is never necessary to have every pastor or man of God or an emir or a traditional ruler or a military general to be interested in changing Nigeria because these guys are never going to let Nigeria change. It just requires some 6% of frustrated citizens of very enlightened critical mass coming together and be willing to take the risk and consequences of their actions and inactions, push ideas out, you know, conscientize, mobilize, educate people. And on a final note, let the revolution start from the head and eventually make it happen by putting boots on the ground. So having read, studied, and seen some of the practical experiences of this happen, especially in the last few years. In fact, it would interest you that the world has experienced more revolutions in the last 20 years than it ever did since the idea of revolutions started in the 17th uh, uh, century or 16th century. The world has experienced in the last 20 years more than we've ever had. So what did that teach you? That the world was actually changing right behind, you know, in, in front of us, but we just weren't taking care. We have been taking note of these revolutionary changes because sometimes people think that revolutions happen and they announce themselves. The problem, which is a question we probably haven't got into, it's what is there in terms of having a revolution that helps you manage the expectation of those who should have the revolution. I wanted to give you the example of NSAS. NSAS is, a, is an example of the 6% I'm telling you. Yes, there was no participation in Kaduna or you know, Sokoto in NSAS, but it was being embraced already after it got to the second stage, in which places like Joss had some of the biggest you know, civil war prizes during NSAS. And Muslims and Christians came together to share what belonged to them at the warehouse, what you now know as palliatives, right? And there were no disagreements. There was no ethnicity on that day. And there were millions and millions of people. They didn't need to pray. They didn't need to speak any language. They were going after a particular product. That day, it was a palliative. But in this case, in the case of revolutions, it will be emancipation. And people were asking, well, let me go back to the question I was uh, trying to answer, which you hadn't asked, was that when people hear about revolutions, they only read the sanitized version of you know, the end product. People, for example, did not know that the French Revolution itself lasted more than 10 years before it became well-known and well-studied. And that even some of the people who participated in the revolution carry out a red campaign in which they exterminated themselves. Most people also did not know that a hundred years after the first French Revolution, an attempt was made by the same family to reimpose the order that brought about the revolution and was resisted. The Cuban Revolution did not happen in two weeks. It happened over a long period of time. American revolutions, you know, uh, if you want to call it that, the Russian Revolution, they did not happen in two weeks. But here we are dealing with the problem of management of expectation. People just want the revolution to happen just now. It's not happening in two weeks. They want to go back to where they're coming from. The other part of revolution, which is tricky that most people don't know, is the masses. 
the masses make revolutions happen. And the moment it happens, the masses go back to where they are. Revolutions are then micromanaged. I mean, the outcome of revolutions are then micromanaged by the critical mass we are talking about. Nigeria is capable of meeting all these conditions I've stated to you. And a taste of it for me was NSAS. Well, that is, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so along those lines, Shawore, uh, as a follow up, uh, because I think yes. people get confused. Uh, like you rightly said, uh, revolution is a word that scares some people, that instills concerns and confusion in others. And, you know, so, I mean, clarify for us. I, I want us to walk us through the specifics of your call for revolution, you know, the, this revolution that you're advocating. What would it look like? Uh, who would it target? And what would exactly would be its end goal? Those, those three connected questions. Yes. You know, it would definitely make itself clear mm. after it's successful. Then who will it target? Oh, absolutely. It will target the oppressive class. It will target the buccaneers. It will target the liars. It will target the gerrymanders. It will target the carpetbaggers. You know, it will target the loan sharks in our system. It will target to the level of even landlords. That's how far it will go. This, this revolution will get to a point where people will no longer be going to the churches they were going to on, you know, after the revolution because they would have realized that these platforms you know, I mean, all the several platforms, churches, mosques, you know, their social circles were actually part of the organized gang up that held, that had withheld the emancipation for all these years. In terms of the outcome, uh, if your last question is direct or correct to that effect, is to bring about a new social political order, a new social order, a new political order, a new financial order in the system, an order that is egalitarian. But I know when you use the word egalitarian, people just laugh at you because it looks like some buzzword for just, you know, motivational speeches. And I hate motivational speakers uh, when they tell you everything will be all right and you know it's not going to be all right. So, but I think we have a concept of the thing Nigeria should be. You and I discuss this we discuss this a lot. In fact, we used to have a small team of persons uh, around me, I don't want to reveal names, who we believe that what we could use the internet for could spark an internal uprising in Nigeria when we were abroad. That was our goal in those days. So the contest that was behind our writings in those days was to just make people get worked up enough to say, look, enough is enough. But unfortunately, we didn't achieve that because mm -hmm. It needed to go to the next stage. And that was taking the necessary risk of leaving whatever we were doing behind and you know, taking a dive into the mud, which is Nigeria. So I've never seen any country else where you have a mirror that shows what Nigeria wants to look like. There's no Nigerian you ask how they want their Nigeria to look like that can't tell you. So if you were even sitting down here telling you, oh, this Nigeria, it will be a little bit even dictatorial, you know, because at the end of the day, my job might just be to make this happen and allow other people who are better equipped by myself. Okay. It's going to be frozen. We've lost his audio. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll come back. Yes. That's the internet for you.
Yes, it's very weak. We're very weak signals, uh, especially in where he's speaking from. So we'll just wait until he reconnects. You know, we've lost you. Uh, he's no longer with us, I don't think. It's not just the audio anymore, I think. Let me see. We may have lost him uh, completely. To be yes, okay. He's restoring his system. Let's give him some patience. <laughs> why, why waiting for him? If anybody wants to say something, you can go ahead. Anyone you want, why waiting for him? Ambali Abukabia. Go ahead. Ambali Abukabia wants um, Mr. Shorek joins. We will um, stop you. Ambali, go ahead, please. Ambali, go ahead. Please unmute him. Unmute him. Go ahead. We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I am so much appreciative of the opportunity, sir. Um, as you can see, my place here is a little bit dark. I'm on a sick bed, yet I try hard to join this conversation because I know it's, it's so much important. I'm a, a student of literature, and of course, I've been following um, uh, so away a fight for Nigerian that works for her. I'm so much happy that um, Sas, you bring him on board and you give us the chance to say one or two things. I think it's important to realize that it's um, high time we fought for the country that we want. Theoretically speaking, every day that I think about the country, I feel weak. The country works me, so to say. So much that I. I think if there's any platform that can actually you know, facilitate uh, stop to making in Nigeria that will work for everyone. But in our own in a way, in, in, with our little experience, we'll see that we'll push through writing, through interviews, through any means possible for us to see ourselves out of this mess. I'm in Nigeria and I'm here and I've been really much you know following all your conversation even the writings of a professor in Falola, you know so so i am sending these words to uh so away condolences and i and i will say that you shouldn't stop continue in body and spirit we are with you and together we will see it in Nigeria that works for everyone thank you sir Welcome back. Moses, please continue. Bring back Moses. Bring back Professor Chonu. Yes. Okay, I think he was in the middle. Uh, Shawore was in the middle of a thought. So if if he doesn't mind, he could, uh, he wants to finish that thought before I, you know, maybe I have a follow up question. Shawore, you were, yeah, you were. Please go ahead and finish your thoughts, your worry, and then I have a follow-up question. Yes, uh, I, I was I was wondering. I, I just want to, because of people who might just have joined, can you just repeat quickly? Um, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so the question was about you know the specifics of uh, your worry's advocacy for revolution, yeah. uh, the target of yeah. such a revolution, what it would look like, yes. and the outcome. Yes. So, so where I was uh, headed before I got uh, interrupted by the network here is that I think the ideas are pretty clear where what we want Nigeria to be. What we haven't been able to agree upon is the amount of 
commitments people are willing to put to it. Uh, and I want to say one thing regarding revolutions. Now, even on the eve of revolution, there can be revolutionary confusion. Uh, that was the opening question of uh, uh, Professor Falola earlier. Why, in spite of you know all the things that's going wrong in Nigeria, people are just you know uh, immune to immune to uh, what's going on all around them, and they're having parties. They are you know getting entertained or uh, tickled by things that you think are very superficial. Yes, we we are. At that stage, also of revolutionary confusion, where people don't even know what in the you know amongst all the variety of solutions presented to them is the one that is going to fit you know uh, the future. But I think generally we have enough people, uh, we have resources to determine the future that we need. What the resources we don't have enough of is the courageous men and women that are willing to. Take a plunge. You know, we, I don't think we have that number yet. I would, uh, uh, I would admit that that's still lacking. As soon as we have those numbers, I guarantee you that uh, the the rest is easy. Well, well, well. Thank you for that far-reaching uh, answer, Shawari, because it actually uh, leads me to my next uh, question. You see, uh, you you spoke about confusion, but there is one there is one issue that uh, on which there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a lot of confusion now about this issue. As, as a matter of fact, there seems to be a, a consensus developing around this uh, issue uh, among the elites, both the ruling elites or the intellectual elites, even among uh, some, some, of, some of the radicals, some people who advocate uh, radical change. And that, that issue is the issue of restructuring. And some people may say, well, revolution seems like an extreme measure. Uh, and restructuring is more feasible, it's more achievable, and it's more realistic because it will help us not solve the entire problems that uh, plague the country, but it will help us to douse the tensions, to reduce the acrimony between the regions, the mutual suspicions, uh, insofar as restructuring means devolution, true federalism, resource control, some people understand it in different ways, regional autonomy, and so on and so forth, uh, decentralization, uh, but you are my friend, and, and I follow your thoughts, and I follow your interventions a lot. And you've been relatively silent on the debate around restructuring, even as it has, uh, you know, gone beyond the South. It used to be part of uh, mostly uh, part of the Southern political conversation. Now you have prominent voices like uh, Professor Atahiru Jega in the North, who have been writing and advocating for restructuring. So it seems like there there is some clarity and and uh, consensus developing around restructuring as an ameliorative uh, project, but you don't seem to have bought into it. My question to you uh, is, what is your position exactly on restructuring? Why do you not seem so enthusiastic about it? And don't you think it's more feasible, as some people argue, than outright revolution? Well, let, let me be very clear about this. One, I'm not silent on restructuring at all. What I have been opposed to is where and who will drive the process of restructuring. That's number one. I think in your answer earlier, and sorry, your question earlier, you said a lot of people are afraid of the sound of the word revolution. You know, I'm also afraid of any kind of solution at this, pro at this point that the people who a revolution should target are comfortable with. Do you get my point? Um, they are comfortable with restructuring. That makes me even more suspicious of the kind of restructuring they are looking for. So it looks like you are trying to drive people out of uh, a place, but then you let them determine when they leave or how they exit through the back or the front. And eventually they decide not to leave and lock you out because you said, well, let them decide when to leave. I'm going to take a tour. The second part of my position is that at this point in the, in, in the life of Nigeria, I am no longer interested in advocating for half measures. 
you know, I think we're past the stage of reforms. And restructuring to me appears like, you know, putting another band-aid on the cancer uh, that will not heal the, the, you know, because of, of that will not heal the problem. That is why I have been very clear. I have a feeling, not a feeling, I have a conviction that Nigeria has passed the stage of destruction because I have studied and listened and read upon the different positioning about restructuring. And I think, let me be honest with you, not all the people are advocating for restructuring are also advocating for the same thing. So it is also looking like a subterfuge of an escape from the reality of Nigeria's social political dire straits that we have found ourselves. So that is the reason why I'm more comfortable with something that goes, you know, entirely cleanse the system. And we take it from there. One other thing that you must know is that you and I have also experienced these kinds of interventionist positioning of the ruling class before. There was a time in the Niger Delta region that they were saying resource control. They even had a bowler hat named after it. Everybody wore it, you know. And when the resource that was to be controlled came, you know, they just created oil shakes and more corrupt men and women. And it created a number of, uh, you know, uh, overlords in the creeks that just made life more miserable for the people of the Niger Delta region. And you remember that that's where I was born and raised, the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. So, and some of the people who were advocates of uh, resource control, the Bola Hat one in those days, are now the same elements applying for restructuring. The last word to say regarding restructuring is I have seen the way the political class deems itself. This has the characteristics of that system where they, they are, you know, they are choked and they find a way out by selling a dummy to the people who are choking them and eventually turn around and choke the people with the same positioning that they sell or with the same strategy that they said we solve all these problems. Mm -hmm. I have sat down with several of the people who are positioning on restructuring. A lot of them older people who are the departure lounge of life. Their positions are all different. The ones of the Southwest are different from the ones of the Southeast. The ones from the North, including some of these intellectuals we are talking about, the moment you see them embracing this kind of position, there is something that is not open to us. Because you know what? The Nigerian state, the Nigerian state as originally created is a supermarket for the elites. And they are not going to let it get to a point where the profits and dividends go to the people who are not stakeholders. That's why they use the word stakeholders. What do stakeholders mean? If there are people who, when it is time for meeting on restructuring, will lock me, you, Professor Falola, out of the meeting. They will lock us out. They will get themselves appointed, elected, and they will go in there and bring out the same documents, change the dates, and we will be the ones advocating and fighting for change again. Instead of doing that every circle, I just think it's time to just put an end to all of this at once, you know, rebuild, take it all down at once and stop deceiving ourselves that, you know, if you take one pillar and put it back and you add a few more irons, you know, the building will keep standing anyway, even though there are cracks all over it. Why don't you just take the damn building apart? New kit. That's a, that's a fair point, uh, Shawore, because obviously we cannot deny the fact that uh, restructuring has become a convenient buzzword for people uh, who want to challenge the status quo. Uh, it's become politicized. Some people weaponize it when they are in opposition. And then when, in, when they get into government, uh, you know, they, they are silent on it. They pretend not to know what it means. Some other people, it's a weapon of blackmail, political blackmail. You know, for some other people, uh, like you rightly said, it's just uh, an instrument of uh, bargaining for benefits and political power. Uh, 
Um, and, and there's a lot of confusion, a great deal of confusion. So yeah, absolutely, uh, fair point. Uh, so, so I guess that leads us to the, what, 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 the, what, what, what is the way out? Because you are an advocate for revolution, but at the same time, you are an advocate for political participation. You're, you were a presidential candidate uh, two years ago uh, under the platform of AAC, the African Action Congress. And uh, in the future, you may have another presidential run in your future. This is not the occasion to reveal it, but that's OK. So my, my question then is, um, you know, do you have a PDP, APC political elite that is a behemoth that stands in the way of revolutionary change, that stands in the way of radical change, the way that you and I imagine it? How would political participation get us there? That's the first part of the question. The second part is that there are people who look at you and say, Shawore, it's all fine and good that you are now uh, participating in the process after staying out of it for so long that you are now in the thick of it. You now are running for president. But your party, the AAC, is a fringe party. It simply doesn't have the resources. It doesn't have the national spread to make a dent in the APC, PDP, uh, rotational elite system or system of oppression. How would you respond to this type of criticism? And how can you, some people say, Shawari, you need to form or you need to join a bigger, more well-funded party with a national spread so that you can, you can stand a better chance of overthrowing the PDP, APC oppressive system that has become so inimical to progress in Nigeria. How would you, how, what would be your response, Shawara? Yeah, sorry, in a, in your internet, I, mean, I think your, your uh, stem was going on now. Can you oh. hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Prof, you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You are breaking up a little bit, but I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So let me use the example of the African National Congress, the ANC in South Africa. It has always been a political movement, party, but it did not participate in you know, uh, elections until 1994, right? So I too have been a political participant in Nigeria's political life for 30 years. I just haven't been part of partisan politics. I joined partisan politics for the first time in 2018. So in casting our revolutionary uh, actions and ideas and processes, part of our strategy is to have political participation at the highest levels happening, consciousness that people understand that after the revolution, we are going to need a party that will take Nigeria to that place that we have always promised we would take Nigeria to, or people can take. So there's nothing wrong with having a political party or political movement. In fact, before 20, before a party was registered in our name in 2018, a political movement known as a take it back movement that was started in a diaspora and then came to Nigeria. Contrary to what the PDP and the APC make you believe, they do not have national spreads. It's not true. What they have are transactional platforms for elections. And those people who partake in this transactional marketing, I mean, uh, you know, uh, electoral processes can be PDP today, they can be APC tomorrow, they can also be fringe party next tomorrow. Because if you look at the history of the APC itself, the APC was formed less than a year before, or maybe almost close to a year before it won national elections in Nigeria, across Nigeria. So the fact that the PDP was around for 16 years did not stop the APC from defeating the PDP in 2015. The fact that the APC has been around since 2014, or 2015, yeah, I think 2014, does not mean that they, will not, they can't be defeated, you know, in the right political space. But where we differ is that we are not going blindly into another election. We are not just going to package ourselves and go and become 
part of the statistical numbers of voters and participants in the election in 2023 or whenever elections will happen because it's obvious that the way Buhari is going probably doesn't even have any plan to relinquish power. It's becoming more and more obvious, but again, that is uh, to be debated at, at another time. So the creation of a political party, the maintenance of a political party is what it is. It's create a political party that continues to promote uh, agenda, ideas, philosophy, innovation, and ultimately will be able to participate in political elections when the time is right. Just like I gave you the example of the ANC that has been around since the 20s, I did not win elections, until, I did not even participate in elections until 1994. That might be debatable. I think there was a time even the apartheid regime wanted to court them into the electoral process, but uh, it wasn't successful. But the one that we know to be successful was uh, at around 1994 for the first time after Mandela was released. So there's nothing confusing there to, to add political participation or political partisanship which is ultimately where we are all headed, even after the revolution anyways, uh, to hone your skills, you know, develop your party membership, grow it, but make it a working revolutionary party, a fighting party. And when the process of revolution is com completed, the party comes in and, you know, help, uh, I mean, participate and compete in elections. But let's also, said that at the rate at which we are going and the rate at which Nigerian people are tired of both the PDP and the APC, a new party that is trusted coming into office uh, at this time with the right people will also be revolutionary change. And I wanted to just bring us back a little bit, sir, that all the people that are asking for restructuring, a referendum, secession, they are all advocating for a revolution. It's just that they don't understand, you know, I don't understand why they don't get it. Because anything that breaks the back of the current operational mode in Nigeria is going to be a revolution. There is no referendum in the Nigerian constitution, the fake constitution that they are using now. There is no you know, uh, self-determination in the constitution. There is even no restructuring, as people like to believe it. I mean, the full package, not the low budget one in the constitution, if any of these processes come to pass in Nigeria of today, you have brought about some kind of a revolution, you know? But when people hear the word revolution, they are just thinking that, oh, a revolution is a process that includes bloodshed. I think that's what people are scared of when they hear the word revolution. Uh, that's, that, but I, I just need to also clarify that. And I tell that to the self-determination groups, and they look at me and say, oh, wow, maybe you are right. You know, because you want to break Nigeria, <laughs> that's a revolution. Definitely, that's a revolution. Well, I'll ask a final question and then I'll yield the spot to the other interviewers. Uh, again, Shawore, thanks for these far reaching and uh, illuminating answers. Uh, you know, we have a current regime that we're dealing with that has become tyrannical, that has become oppressive, that is incompetent by universal acclaim, but that I think more, even more disturbingly is very divisive. It has deepened our fissures and our divisions and our differences. This regime has manipulated it and has in that process imperialed the survival of the nation itself. I, for the first time, in my uh, 40 something years of existence on this earth, I truly, truly fear for the future of this country. Now, uh, this man, uh, the head of this government, Muhammad Buhari, came to power at a particular time and he rode to, he rode to power on a sentiment of frustration among the populace. But there was a particular media narrative that was created of him as an agent of change, right? There was that media narrative. And he opportunistically, some people might say, rode on that narrative to power. My question to you, Shawara, is do you have any regrets at all for using your platform of Sahara Reporters for, to further that narrative of 
uh, Buhari as an agent of change? And or do you have any regrets for not doing enough to challenge that media narrative that some people argue uh, Buhari exploited to come to power? No, uh, see, you know a little bit about Sahara reporters. It was set up as a citizen reporting platform. Mm. Operating word, citizen reporting. Mm. What it means is that that sentiment you're expressing, the prevailing sentiment at that time, was mm. also in existence, mm. if you remember, and you were, you and I were involved in this, the previous political circle, when there was a guy called Omaru Yaradua, and he was he was brain dead in Saudi Arabia, and they were manipulating the whole country, the entire country. It was the same platform that citizens ran to. You know, when I say citizen, it's like the Sahara reporter's style is a content creation that then attracts distribution, promotion, you know, through commentaries, through distributions you know, through editorializing by individuals. And that was what brought this particular person that was defeated in 2015 to power. Don't forget that. We had no control when, because you, you, you and I and the rest of us were having conversations on a daily basis. We couldn't control what the public wanted. That, Jonathan was allowed to become president of Nigeria, whether he's competent or not. Nobody asked what Jonathan. In fact, I remember when Jonathan was coming, there was the issue of whether his PhD thesis existed or not. We couldn't find it, but nobody cared because it was a citizen reporting platform. This is powered by microblogging websites, you know, like Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. By 2015, there was, it wasn't a narrative that was the issue. Let's be very clear about that. Is that Nigerians came to a sorry pass that the Jonathan regime was such a disappointment by way of his corruption activities that was transparent to the world. In fact, if there was anything transparent during the Jonathan regime period, it was his, trans, I mean, his corruption activities. They didn't hide it. you know. You could see if you pass the windows of their house, you see dollars falling out of the windows. So, and Sahara Reporters was reporting consistently, not on the narrative, the media narrative you are talking about, but on the scandals that were prevalent in that government every day. If there was any media narrative, probably from you know um, columnists and contributors. But it was never focused by, by 2015, I mean, by 2012, brother, Jonathan had lost Nigeria's election. And it was that uprising in 2012, known as Occupy Nigeria, which was bigger than any other Occupy that happened all over the US where Occupy uh, was, was imported from. So by 2012, Nigerians had decided that Jonathan's regime was over. And the narrative was his corruption and, you know, and everywhere you look, you just found scandals and scandals and scandals. So what am I telling you? He was Jonathan and his regime, you could mention them, you know, that has to be blamed for creating the socioeconomic conditions that allowed any narrative at all to thrive. Mm any narrative at all. Where they used for their narrative was in Sahara Report. And I can tell you that for free. The media in Nigeria was in bed with them. They were paying them. They were paying even foreign media platforms. I remember uh, CNN interviewed Buhari through, what's that lady? Um, the popular war reporter who is now uh, a talking head at CNN. It's an Amampo. You know, when you find a Buhari who could not pronounce his name correctly on Christian Amapo suddenly, you know that that's not small media narrative. But I or Sahara reporters never interviewed Buhari, never. 
In fact, the only thing that we did that made people to really feel that, wow, you guys are different, was that we announced the outcome of that election before INEC. And it was the first time that it happened in Nigeria's media history, that the outcome of an election accurately was reported by a media platform before the official announcement. And that was what prevented Jonathan and his people probably from rigging the election. And by the time INEC had not gotten to 12 states, Jonathan himself had considered the election to Buhari. How do you blame anybody for that? There's no, there's no reason to blame Sahara reporters for it. But you know, it is the narrative that Sahara reporters brought Buhari to power that I think is the media narrative that is well-funded now. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because I am their target. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I take it with honor that I'm hated in equal capacity or measure by the APC and the PDP, equal measure, you know. And the reason is simple. I have been able to prove, or the platforms that I reported today have been able to prove that it is an equal opportunity uh, offender against the political class. Because the same thing we did against Yaradua at that time is the same thing we did against Jonathan. And it's the same thing we are doing now against the Buhari regime. If Buhari could ban Sahara reporters, he probably would have banned Sahara reporters before he banned Twitter. And I can tell you that part of the reason why they banned Twitter, if you count 10, Sahara reporters would be somewhere up you know, on the ladder. So that's just to make the clarification. Thank you. That is very helpful. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Muzuzochonu for all your great questions and the answer. Before I call on the next speaker, let me follow up on um, the professor's question. So we have a situation in which the APC is not doing well. Everyone criticizes the Buari regime on a daily basis. Prices of food have gone up and corruption is not down. So what do you think, why is the APC still in control? Why does it have a grip on power with all these contradictions? Why is the PDP so weak that it cannot even be a good opposition party? There is no, are you done with question, Pro? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I'm done. Yeah. If you look at it very well, these two political parties are two sides of the same coin. And that's why when uh, Moses asked me the question about who will be the targets of the revolution, you know, I mentioned a particular group of persons or characters known as carpet baggers. Uh, carpet baggers are people in a Nigerian contest who will go to sleep as APC and they wake up as PDP. So except we are going to accept the fallacy that APC is different ideologically or physically <laughs> or in any form or shape or format from the PDP. There's no reason why you know, PDP can oppose APC. It's not possible. It's just like asking for the lower job to be opposing the upper job. You know, they both have a job in chewing the cord. So it's just what it is. There is no difference, Professor, between APC and PDP. It's the guys who were in APC in 2015 that are now in PDP. It's the guys who were in PDP in uh, since uh, 2019 that all moved back to APC. So how can they oppose themselves? They're the same. You know, I'm sure that the same people who wrote, I think it was a person who wrote PDP uh, constitution that wrote the first constitution of the ACN, actually, uh, you know, 
that's uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Chibola again. So it's the same person. They, they, they have the same, if you look at their constitution, they have the same similarities uh, and uh, operational uh, uh, modus operandi. So there's nothing different, sir. There's no way these two people, these two political parties can oppose themselves. They are the same one and the same. The only difference is the color of their flag. Thank you very much. Before I call on our next speaker, uh, I want to express our gratitude to eight platforms that are streaming this. For those of us watching by this Zoom, at some point it was 400 people, which is large, it's still a very large number. What we do is to use this Zoom to connect to various platforms. And two of the platforms are 4 million members. Usually they will send us, some of the platforms will send us the number of viewers, uh, which is usually a lot. Uh, I am very grateful to them. Uh, some of the platform owners are here. Tunde Kilani is here with us. We, we are on his platform, Memframe, which is a large platform. Uh, uh, I saw Musa Didayo is also here, which is streaming this on live television to over a million people. So we are very grateful to them. We are grateful to African briefings and other people that allow us to stream this conversation. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Alaka, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Wallace Wenka Center for investigative journalism, the organization that does investigative reporting in the country. She's worked in various communication projects for social entrepreneurship, political development, advocacy for inclusive governance, facilitating collaborations among journalists. Um, she's interested in girls and women mainstream issues. And she's developed a variety of strategies and curricula to promote many of these ideas. Welcome, uh, Ms. Muturayu Alaka. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Tony Falola. And um, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, Good evening to you, Shoure, Mr. Omoyele Shoure. It's good to see you here. Um, I want to commiserate with you first um, on the loss of your brother, Olachide. I know what it is like to lose um, a close family member. I've lost a mother, I've lost an elder sister, an immediate elder sister. I also know what it is when um, that loss is very close to systemic failure and um, you can you can know that uh, the loss was avoidable. And uh, when you live your life in service to country, it can be even more painful to find that um, the same things that you're fighting for uh, beat you that hard home. So I commiserate with you. Um, and I appreciate you for making this meeting. I understand the, I understand the commitment uh, to humanity and commitment to common good that makes one, despite personal tragedy, show up for this kind of meeting. So thank you um, for that show of integrity and commitment to community. So my, my first question is, um, you know, uh, on earlier in the year, March 2nd, to be precise, you were at the court and you were at the court with uh, somebody in street palace who called Jujuma right behind you and uh, in the news some people said this was Shoure's spiritual advisor some people said it was a studio man you answered to say that um, on bbc pg you said that well it was just a man who was you know a traditionalist who was showing his religion but throughout um, the time you were in court this man was positioned behind you he seemed to have been making some incantations because he was murmuring all through and was positioned behind you. So what, what really was the game? Was it uh, 
to create some drama, some comic relief? Was it just that a friend was showing solidarity? Thank you. Uh, my answer is simple. I think Africans should stop explaining to anybody how they dress to anywhere, you know. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who is widely, widely known as uh, an activist, a peace activist from India, wore a sharong, sharong for most of his life, except when he was in South Africa and briefly in the UK. Uh, he didn't have to explain it to people. It was a culture. So if I go to court with an African dress in African attire, whether it's positioned behind me or in front of me, whatever he carried, as long as an African is dressed in his attire, which is his church, I mean, so it's choice, it's not a problem. And we shouldn't be defending that. It is part of the colonial you know, uh, you know, uh, problem that we inherited, that we have to explain, we have to dress a certain way. Uh, and I just, this is the way I explain it, right? But there's also another context to it. And the context is that same court I had been with the pastor before, it was not reported. Uh, I was accompanied. I didn't take the pastor. I was, I was accompanied. The same court I was accompanied to uh, by a Muslim cleric who had his turban all the way to the back of it, I mean, it wasn't reported, but the media, because in the same way they came and said everything we had is inferior, uh, they asked us to throw some of them away and then they took the rest and they are all in their museums now. So we don't have to stretch this beyond what it is. Let's accept who we are as Africans, dress. West African, since we are not ashamed to wear suits, we shouldn't also be ashamed to wear uh, car shells and whatever we put on our clothes when we go out to any official engagement or unofficial, I mean, unofficial engagement. But I'll say one last thing, which is the part that would be fun to you guys. Uh, it was when I went with uh, the so called special advisor that I got the most relief from the judge. Even the since we didn't ask the, the relief that lawyers didn't ask for, they were giving us, you know, ah, Mr. Shore, oh, don't worry, don't do this. Everybody that they said should say now, because they said you can go home. So maybe mentally too, it had an impact on the judge. I don't know. So it worked. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. I, I thought to start with something that made us laugh a bit. Um, also, my next question is about uh, the issue of uh, verification. The fact that Sarah reporters, you know, operates as a leaks platform, it has uh, broken so many uh, valid news that's um, helped to give people perspective to uh, information that sometimes um, even legacy media is afraid to publish um, for various reasons. Uh, but do you find the need to? in the face of increasing misinformation and uh, disinformation and the attacks on truth, do you find a need to um, more intentionally uh, create a, a, more, a more solid system of verification for publications on the platform? Can you repeat that? I lost part of uh, your questions due to network, I think. Can you please repeat that? I okay, apologize. I was, uh, yeah, that's fine. I was saying that Sahara Reporters operates as a leaks platform and has broken a lot of news, um, a lot of valid news that's given access to information that uh, sometimes is not available on even legacy media platforms for um, so many other reasons. However, in the face of growing misinformation and disinformation and attacks on truth, do you find a need to uh, make to strengthen the verification process of the things that are published on that platform. Uh, let me answer it 
two ways. One is that every platform that's in existence must continue to improve or perish. Oh. So yeah, if you don't improve, you know, especially in the face of the kind of fierce competition that's out there regarding how content is created, how news is churned out, how breaking news is out there, you're gonna just fade out. It should be to the credit of how Sahara Borders was conceived and operated over these years that it has existed for 15 years as a major force in the news industry in Nigeria or the content creation industry in Nigeria. And Moses Oshono is somewhere here. They helped me. They, they, used to, they, they used to help me until I went to politics and didn't get directly involved in uh, with Sahara Reporter. Secondly, you see, sometimes I get tired of people saying, oh, verify your news. And when you ask them which, which part of the news is not correct, they can't point it to you. They just have a problem with the context that Sahara Reporter presents is facts. They're not used to it. You know, uh, they are to get these facts, you know, or why did you publish somebody's credit card, you know, uh, information? Or, you know, why are you so audacious? That's what people question us mostly about. You know, it's, I think it's more about the methodology than it is of whether news is factual or not. I have said it repeatedly. If any news media in Nigeria needs to improve or stop fake news, it should start with NTA, the Nigerian Television Authority, because they're the one who tell you the news every evening that the economy is improving when the economy is not improving. They are the one who tells you that the president is well when he's not well. They are the one who tells you that Nigerians are happy when they are sad. So who gives you the first, you know, who gives you fake news the most? Government platforms. The Ministry of Information misinforms people, misleads people. Then you can never get accurate information from any government platform. But they turn around and, you know, just uh, scandalize these platforms, including, I'm sure, your own, because they're not comfortable with the stories you're writing. There are several ways through which uh, to challenge stories. I have been sued in the US five different times, accused initially of fake news. And when we got to court, the judges found out the, 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 the stories were accurate. In fact, last week, I mean, about a month ago, a judge in Maryland, Sarah Reporter's lawyer, $7,000 because a, a man of God lied. He was spreading fake news and it was a hire that was right. The case is still in court. We haven't concluded it. But the moment he discovered that the, the US court is no longer willing to entertain his lies, he has come back to another judge in Aquaibon to restart the case where they have control over back, the back door. So what I'm telling you is that if these days, and this is for the news platforms that are that are on the internet in particular, blogs, what great news content in Nigeria. The biggest punishment you can get for the fake news is not in governments, it's not a law court. They are your readers. The readers and users and consumers of content are unforgiving if you tell them fake news because they are the fact checkers themselves. And the moment you discover that you are not doing what you are, you are pushing out information, like, you will lose credibility. You will completely lose credibility because they are forgiving and they will keep reminding you screenshot because the internet doesn't forgive. They are the ones regulating you, your consumers, the consumers of your content. So fake news has become government's own buzzword for suppressing the truth. So all they need to do is to say, it is fake news. How can somebody like Lai Mohamed determine fake news? when all he lives for is fake news. All he tells is fake news. Even in his life, how can you be listening to such a person? Not to say, and I'll conclude there, that these things don't exist, but there's a difference between deliberate you know, fake news uh, content production or mistakes.
occasionally when you are dishing out over 40 stories a day, there's the possibility that you can misspell names. You can not, you may not get dates wrong, right? You know, or documents, you know, or photos that are used as illustration may not be exactly. Those ones are well known and it's industry standard issue. It's, it has nothing to do with just fake news. But to just call every story you disagree with fake is not the same thing as problem of fake news. And we need to be very careful about that. Thank you. Um, so as at um, 31st of August um, this year, we have um, we had 84 million plus registered voters in the country. Um, you contested in the last election and you had um, 33,953 uh, votes. What is the strategy that you have if you intend to run again in 2023, assuming you were running again in 2023? What strategy do you have to get um, the two thirds majority or a good number of votes that pushes closer to that goal of um, being the president of the country? The strategy is not to walk blindly into another alley of the seats. There was no election, and I said categorically to people that if voting, uh, getting voting uh, votes counted and proper results released is what is called election, that process did not happen in 2019. Anybody who claims that an election happened in 2019 is not being honest. So the number that was allocated to me is not what I got in that election. If the election, a proper election had happened, in which we, myself, Kisi Mogalu, and other young candidates are allowed to debate Buhari and Atiku on the same platform, there's no way Nigerians will vote for them. It's not possible. That's just number one. The second aspect of it is what we did. I cannot speak for the other young candidates, but I can speak for myself. Traveling energetically to 34 states, bringing about the manifesto that they are even shamelessly stealing from, you know, about how to revive the economy, security, health, agriculture, um, technology, how an economy can work, how to fight corruption, you know is how to create an inclusive country. There's nobody that could come near us in terms of those ideas. Are you telling me that Nigerians would not want to vote for me over Atiku, I mean, over Atiku and Buhari, except if the qualification to become president is if you have arthritis? You understand? That's, you can't stand on your own. That's the only way those guys could have defeated me in an election. So there was no election. They have INEC there. INEC is a political party itself. It's not a neutral uh, electoral uh, body. And to now respect or be alluding to the fake results that they, you know, they, 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 they collated and allocated to Buhari and gave some to Atiku as legitimate election is something that I reject. So what would be my strategy? A strategy of revolution now that we must clean the space before we go for another election. If you go to, into another election, you're just going to become part of the statistics. If you haven't dealt with the quality of people who are also going to run the electoral process, the quality of the constitution that is going to guide the entire process, the quality of the Nigerian judiciary that can educate if there are disputes from elections, the quality of men and women that should be even be allowed to contest for election. Look at the number of people in the National Assembly who don't even have certificates that are recommended by the constitution before they can contest. And there's nothing done about it. So it's, that's just a small example of this. But so many of them don't even, they don't even know the constituencies they are representing, they have never been there before. They have not been there to contest for election. They didn't win party primaries. So at every level, Everything is wrong with the political process. And that's why we are advocating for 
a total overhaul. That's why we're calling for a revolution regarding these issues so that you don't end up again in 2023 asking me the same question. Now, how come uh, you know you only had 45,000 votes? With this INEC, I don't even think we can have a chance to withstand the chance at all because the body has no credibility. It, didn't, it doesn't have the ability to deliver on the promises and you know and expectations of a democratic nation or democratic elections. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, Ibiru has not been able to join us, but I, there's uh, just one part of the question that she had um, that we thought was important, which is in, about inclusion. I've watched some of your um, the campaigns videos. Uh, and I kind of see it's a lot of boys, like a boys club, a lot of men there. And I know that elections are tough and you go from place to place, but what's, what's your intentional plan to be inclusive of women? I mean, knowing that we are about half the population in the that you propose. Let me let me ask you know that I'm ashamed of myself that throughout the period of the election in 2018 we tried everything we can to you know find a lot of female political participants and we failed miserably in ensuring that we measure up to even our own promise to have a 50-50 cabinet of men and women had we won the election you know it, but. To be honest with you, it's Nigeria is still 100% a man's world. And I think women are not helping. Uh, and, and this is to our women folks who are here and who are watching me. They're not helping by not asserting themselves. How can you be 50% of Nigeria's population and you are doing press conference all the time? Allocate uh, some slot to us now. Edjo now, please give us some slot. Give us some slot. You have the population. Maybe it's time for women to just have a secret meeting and say, look, we are going to vote for a woman in the next election as president. And the person will win. If all the women just agree in Nigeria to vote for a woman, men are gone. That is, you know, and then you can create an all women, you know, uh, cabinet. And all of us will be begging you to be your PAs and be carrying your bag instead of you just like, oh, so just give us some allocation. I think there needs to be, you know, for me, just beyond words, some very conscious efforts by women using their power, using their numbers in this country to just demolish the wall of discrimination and oppression of women. This country is an oppressive state in general, but it's particularly wickedly oppressive of women. That's true. It is written in the constitution that we hate women. You understand? Because we have to write it in the constitution that women uh, are entitled to certain things, but we don't have a place in the constitution where we say men are entitled to this number of slots. We don't have, we have a women affairs ministry in Nigeria. I'm still looking for the man affairs ministry because we don't have respect for women. Otherwise, to create, you know, to, to tell you how much we don't respect women, we created a ministry for them. Because we consider women as not on par with us. You have to have that revolution too. But before you go and start begging, I mean, when be begging for inclusion, don't forget that, don't forget the powerful roles women played in this country too, you know. In 1929, Abba riots, you know that it was staged by women and it had far reaching impact. And there are several historical interventions by women. You know, as you see, as I'm here talking to you, and this is a revolution movement, I'm just hoping that women can just turn our way. We have a lot of female participants in revolution now, but we are nowhere near where we should be. And we believe that the moment women get involved in any liberation movement, it is over for the oppressor, for the oppressors. And I hope 
they hear him loud and clear, you know. So, but had we won, we would have gone and done something almost ahead of, that is creating a parliament, I mean, sorry, an executive uh, uh, body that has 50% of women, 50% of men on board. And we can take it from there because that's by appointment. But women need to just step out. Don't let men keep covering you up either in clothes or you know in a garb of or religion or we're superior to you or physically emotionally you, you know. If men can if men beat you up, go and exercise too and beat them up. You know, this is not the abuse, you know, the oppression and suppression of women, in my view, has got into a level that we should just be ashamed of even being called men because, you know, it's just, it's just sad what I see in this country, how we treat the rights of women. But we are not supposed to be saying, oh, we give you your rights. You are supposed to take it too because you have the numbers. How can you be 50% in the country and you are registered voters and you keep voting for failed men? Is it not possible that you have women who are better than all these, you know, uh, Failed characters running the country. I'm sure they are. So it is time for women to, to just rise. You know, it's time for a woman, you know, a woman revolution to in the country. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'll join you uh, if you lead. If you don't lead, join me. Let's work together. Thank you. Finally, for me, I when you're not calling for a revolution, protesting or calling out government, no for one reason or the other, what do you like to do? What, and what do these things say about what you value the most? Oh, you know, the other things I like to do are things that, you know, would have mattered in a country, in a, a society that would encompass all the things, all the great things that a revolution would bring about my idea of or our idea of revolution you know because i happen to have lived of course outside of the shores of nigeria and i used to do other things you know i used to love running for instance but for you to even wake up and run in nigeria you have to understand that there are no sidewalks but there are sidewalks and bicycles that bicycles and runners can use and walkers can use in ghana i cry here you know just just things that you can do, simple things you can do. But you know what I would have loved to do had this not been my country. I mean, this Nigeria hadn't taken a lot of my time just fighting and fighting all the time. You know, I just would love to be a teacher, which was what my dad was. You know, and I spent ten years as a university teacher in the U.S. Uh, just teaching post-colonial Africa history. I'd have loved to be like uh, Professor Twain, Falala writing books you know uh and just reading and doing a lot of uh physical exercises and swimming uh, and i should say something too uh which is just to brag a bit because you know, i i rarely get a chance to do this is that i'm an entrepreneur too uh not the capitalistic mad entrepreneurship but i I actually created a product that is thriving in the, you know, uh, in the market, you know, in the market of ideas. The platform Sahara Reporters was created by my person. So, and if I was lucky to be in a country where things work, probably that's also a big deal, right? You know, to have a thriving media business that is innovative, creative, and competitive, it's big deal. You know, like I could be sitting just expanding these platforms and creating products and content that could drive it to reach more people and to impact more lives. But here I am uh, with all of this master's degree, you know, living in the diaspora for 20 years. I'm back to going to prison every week, getting my nose broken, getting shot at by police, and getting my brother killed. Uh, you know, just casual like that. That's tough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, 
Miss Motorayo Alaka, we are very, very grateful. Uh, thank you. We are, September 19, we'll be bringing Professor Molefia Shanti, the preeminent figure uh, in the study of um, Afrocentricity. And then in October, we have three people, Dili Mamadu, who also like, um, you run, I think. Uh, we have the Allah for you, who is coming, the second king we're inviting. And then we're talking about survival of languages, bringing Musa Adibayo. Thank you very much. People usually say, now is your audience part. Uh, just indicate by raising your hand if you want to make a comment or ask questions. The way this works is um, uh, the video of um, our guest has disappeared. Hopefully it will come back shortly. We normally will take two questions that were sent to us because these questions are so many and we don't have um, time to check them. Uh, and when we have many people who want to talk, sometimes we appeal to them that we cannot take all of them. Let's wait for the video of uh, Mr. Shuwore to be back because he's as, I think he's, as, he's having some challenges there. Can you hear us, uh, Mr. Shuwore? I can hear you, sir. The video I is can hear you loud and clear. Video is back. So, uh, share going up. Are they tell me when you are it's back? Yes. Tell me when you are ready to take um, questions that were sent to us. Meanwhile, let me call. My video is back. Yes, I can see you. Go, Keo, do jolly. If I don't pronounce your name very well, you have to forgive me. Mr. Goke Udujole. You have to unmute yourself, please. Okay, I just uh, I just unmuted. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Falola. Uh, sure, uh, thank you for uh, standing in the gap for what so many of us don't have the opportunity to do. I think, uh, especially those of us that went to Akoka, we have that uh, vibes. And also you were in Minneapolis, so I met you in 2018 and uh, we had a bit of chat. My question to you would be this, uh, looking at the enormity of the Nigeria situation, how difficult it is to contest that, uh, at the national level, will you consider perhaps going for a lower office, uh, maybe at the state level, to try to create the kind of ideas that you will have loved at the national stage I don't know if uh, if this if a lot of people have uh, spoken to you about this um, because one would really like the kind of things you're propagating to be actualized. I don't want a situation where we will look at you in several years and many people will look at history and says Shawara is a kind of the best president Nigeria never had. Is there a way for you to which you think of going a little bit lower level to this level, bring up the good ideas to which you can people can see you at more on the national stage and embrace those those things you stand for and want Nigerians to experience. That's all I got. Uh, Am I allowed to answer the question? All right. Yes, please go ahead and answer the Bro, question. Am I am I ready? Yes, go ahead. Yes. The all right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh okay, I appreciate uh, your question. My question to you though, and this is first time during this conversation that I'll be asking a question from someone who is asking me a question. If you were to choose between the show that graduated from Unilag that you probably heard about or met before and a Buhari running Nigeria, which would you go for? 
<laughs> if that's an obvious question, you know what my answers will be on that. Okay, so why would we be settling for mediocrity year in, year out? If you trust me enough to run Nigeria better than the characters that are arrayed against us now, why should we then lower our standards by carrying a nuclear bomb uh, to a gunfight? Why do I say that states can be taken care of by people who have state aspirations? Federal government and the presidency of Nigeria is serious business. And it needs people who have energy, who have intellect, who have a people who have the ability to make powerful decisions, big decisions. And that is what Nigeria needs. And that is where we must go next. We can't continue asking Shore to go to the State House of Assembly or the Senate. Uh, and uh, the National Assembly and asking Atiku to go to the presidency. And when he gets to the presidency, you're now saying, oh my God, we are best brains. Another question I have for you, if you are invited to the World Cup today, would you ask Odeg Bami to go and represent Nigeria? Definitely no. Even though you like him, you like his name, but his skill sets, his age, his physical fitness, his mathematics of those days, his trigonometry in football is different from to this innovative way of solving mathematical problems. So, what what this, there's no need to even drag this question further. It is that Nigeria must face the reality of going with the old failed past by limiting ourselves to just people who can win elections and not people who can run Nigeria. Thank you. That's, that's, that's where the question. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tunde AA. Tunde AA. Unmute yourself, please. Tunde AA. He's talking, but we can't hear him. Maybe he's can, not been unmuted, but can by you attack. Tunde AA. He's, he may unmute yourself at your end. Tunde AA. I've completely lost uh, a sense of lost contact. I, I'm not hearing anything, guys. If you can hear me, uh, let me know. I'm not I, hearing anybody. You, it's today AA we are waiting for. Okay. Can we move on to Baba Yi? Then? Okay, I was just unmuted now. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little sure, and I'm glad to to meet, to be seeing you um, for the first time. I voted for you in 2019. Um, 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 and um, I voted for you in 2019 because I've actually been reading up so many things you've been saying in the past. I knew your position on electronic media, on print media. I knew your position you know, on, um, on um, cryptocurrency currently. 
I knew your position on so many things that generates public wealth and, and all that. So, and I see how many of those things play out. I'm, I've seen what has happened with cryptocurrency and the positions of MasterCard, Visa, and all of them today. So follow you specifically because of those progresses. I mean, it's very important for me for someone to say something three years ago, and then you see those things being, I mean, executed by multinationals, big com companies of the world. That's very, very important to me. Now, my questions I'm going to ask you, number one, is that, um, Shore, the, the people that take over after a revolution, they are more important than the revolution. There were revolution, there was a revolution. We can say what happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, our revolutions. What happened in Libya and Egypt, our revolutions. But Libya had a revolution, and what you have in that country today is something else. Rwanda had something close to a revolution in 94, and the country is better off for it. Now, when you have a change, what we had in 1999, and then the emergence of um, the democratic dispensation was closest to a revolution. How do we do it in such a way that not just democracy takes over, but pro-people, pro-people politicians, people who really want the best for the people, people who want to create public wealth and create prosperity for the people? That's the first question. The second question I'm going to be talking about is that when elections are coming very close, sure, many times people keep quiet. The real people that should vote out criminals out of government don't come out of their houses on election day. Most of the people you see, and that's why they always win, are the people that are going to collect 5,000 and 6,000 Naira. How is Nigeria going to, how do you think Nigeria should change this very narrative? Because it's, it's been, and any time you want to have a situation where genuine people really want to vote out, thugs show up in those places and scatter everything. It still happened in 2019. When genuine people that really should vote out crooks show up at the election ballot point, they, get, they end up getting pushed out by thugs. How do we fix this? In some, in some states, like we saw in maybe like a do state and things like that, people stayed on their votes overnight. They refused to go home. They wanted those votes to be counted in their presence. And they made sure that it was done. How do we end up fixing this narrative in such a way that we can have a better country for ourselves? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Tunde. We are very grateful. Let me take that as a comment to save some time. It's a good comment. We are very grateful. Baba Aye, please move forward, please. Baba Aye. Unmute him, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to chip in on one or two two things. Uh, first, uh, I mean, with, with Moses uh, pointing at the issue of um, revolution, now uh, it is very important to stress that. Uh, this was not something that started with Yele Shure or the Coalition for Revolution. We should take our mind back to 1948, the call for revolution of the Zikist National Vanguard. It represented the highlight of genuine struggle for liberation, not just decolonization as the transfer of power from some foreign colonial elites to local oppressors. So it's important to stress this, that the call for revolution and calling for revolution in a sense that puts it at the center of radical politics is actually has a long history uh, uh, in the country, which the likes of Yele, which call, which AAC uh, has to. This is a very important point to note. And uh, we realized that what we got was at best quasi-liberation in 1960. And that is why uh, the, the charter of um, the Coalition for Revolution is charter for total liberation. And talking of the charter, I think uh, Yele sold himself short, although I appreciate the fact he did say that, look, we failed with regards to uh, women and um, you know, participation in the party, in the movement. But why I said he, sell, he sold himself uh, short on this is during the internal debate, which took several months, on the charter in the Coalition for Revolution, Yele was one of the leading 
uh, persons in pushing for, you know, uh, women's rights, pointing out the centrality of women liberation, and even also arguing uh, for the inclusion of uh, the, the rights of uh, sexual minorities, the defense of sexual orientation. And this is something that on the Nigerian left, you even see several people that will declare themselves revolutionaries wouldn't be bold enough to stand up, you know, for sexual minorities as part of uh, the questions of, uh, as part of gender equity. I think this is very important. And finally, the juxtaposition of um, participation in partisan politics, electoral politics, and revolution, I think in a sense, one, it is artificial for any change-seeking party. As Lucy Parsons, who in her own right uh, was a revolutionary and wife of one of the A market matters pointed out that, look, we should not be deceived. The elite will not let us vote away their wealth and their power. And someone else said that, look, if elections will change the system, the ruling class would make it illegal. So we should learn, even if it is in a, from, from uh, uh, IBD said something, said we are not only in office, we are in power. Any revolutionary party that comes to power strictly, no, comes to government strictly on the basis of, of electoral victory is fooling itself. It will at best be in office, but not in power. And that is the essence of what AAC as a driving force of core is doing, which is building, you know, revolutionary democratic struggles, working class and youth power from below. Thank you. Let's take that as a comment and move on to Adegbayi. Adegbayi, please. Adegbayi. Adegbayi, are you there? Please. Hello, Mr. Adibai, where are you? Unmute yourself, please. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm calling from I'm, you know, from the US. I think the last speaker just spoke exactly what I was about to say. If you are a revolutionary, and you want to play partisan politics as it is in Nigeria. It's just, it's like you are doing the same thing that Babangida, Bab Salami did. You want to Maradona everybody. And also, I would also like to say that re re revolutionary, as you define it, is similar to what every other people like those who are clamoring for self-determination and all of them are saying yes indeed but the difference between them and you is they are saying they want to boycott partisan politics as it is in the same faulty constitution you were saying something that the, the constitution that, that we are using is uh, fraudulent and everything but you want to participate in the same uh, uh, political process defined by that faulty constitution. It means that you are not being honest to yourself. Okay. Uh, you know, Mr. So you, you that as a comment as well. So. This question. We will not treat this as a comment, we'll treat it as a major question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shore, this is a serious question. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything I've said tonight and anything I've done since the end of 2019 or our party, our movement have done that is not in alignment with what Mr. Debra is saying. It's the same position we maintain that we're not comfortable with going forward with another election under a faulty uh, constitution. I was the first candidate probably the only candidate in 2019 that said the 1999 constitution was fraudulent. I didn't miss words. I was the first candidate and probably the only candidate that called for the abolition of bicameral legislative system. In fact, you, can, you could hear it everywhere. Me being quoted that I said the Senate has become the house of thieves the Nigerian Senate, and I wouldn't need more than 
one, I mean, a unicameral legislative system. There are several other ideas and pronouncements I made that is in tandem with what our brother is saying. I am not disagreeing with you. And there's my submission probably which you got wrongly uh, is that, that I want to be part of the system going forward. I said I don't want to be part of the statistics of election again, except the system is totally upturned. This fraudulent, criminal, organized uh, deception of their people is totally you know, abandoned because it has become discredited. So I don't, I don't see how we disagree, brother. The person who spoke before you, Baba Ye, is the spiritual leader of our coalition for revolution. Now you're hearing that I have a spiritual leader because <laughs> I knew Baba Ye for, uh, uh, since when I entered the University of Lagos, when I was admitted as a freshman in, into the University of Lagos in, 20, I mean, in uh, 1989. That's since when I knew Baba Ye. So we are not in, uh, we are not in, we are not disagreeing at all. I don't I don't see I, I completely agree with you 100 percent And that's the position of our party. Maybe where you got it wrong was that that we have a political party. And I've explained that to say, look, the ANC was a political party that did not necessarily participate in it. was a fighting fighting party. And that's what AAC is. That's what revolution now, I mean revolution now, and I mean TIB, which is a uh, a movement that we created even before the political party AC. So we we speak the same, we're speaking the same language. Maybe my voice is not as loud. Thank you, sir. Olushola Joel. Olushola Joel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, bring to the knowledge of uh, the platform here about the issue of uh, individual terrorism and state terrorism. In the light of what we have witnessed in Nigeria, uh, terrorism by the state is just the same thing. It's, it's been played out exactly as corruption is being played out. When we had here uh, about 20 million is stolen, then the next thing we hear about 1 billion, you know. If you recall, you know, starting from the assassination of Delegiwa, uh, there has not been any time, at any time, you know, that, hello? Hello? Yeah. There has not been any conclusive investigative reports, you know, that really uh, bring people down to justice. Uh, the same thing uh, happens uh, in a country like uh, uh, Sankara, you know, that uh, a Blaise, uh, Blaise Compare is being tried today, you know, it's a leap. I want to know whether Mr. Showere uh, will be able to put some of this uh, issue of uh, state terrorism in the manifesto, you know, because uh, making people to be accountable for what they are doing, you know, either opposition or the state in power, you know, uh, will uh, really uh, make the citizens, you know, to have boldness to be in support. But when you can do a way, you can, you can just kill, we, we heard of a student that was killed just uh, about two weeks ago at Lasso. You know, this thing has been continuing. But when individual commit a, a, a simple or a small offense against the state, they tried and even the citizens, you know, so I I, I, I really want, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really in agony in my heart, you know, we, because we are talking of S-men, we are talking of uh, terrorism, we are talking of uh, Boko Haram, but I look at it, you know, as a political uh, machination being played out day by day. You know, we uh, so, some people are manipulating some things and everything. I don't know whether either the ruling class or the, or the opposition party. 
That's my, that's my uh, question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's treat that as a comment. Um, Dr. Fagua, your turn, please. Temitope Fagua. Temitope Fagua. Yes, Prof. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, please go ahead. Apologies, uh, Prof. Uh, I, I, I won't be able to turn on my video because of the network. Um, Prof, firstly, want to thank you for this consistency. And I also want to send um, solidarity greetings to Commissioner Ore uh, and also to send our condolences over the loss of um, our brother, you know, uh, Brother Olajide. Um, Comrade, I quickly want to use this opportunity to say that the discussion so far, you know, have been extremely interesting. And I think that um, it should be a challenge to the vast majority of our people that are online, that are in attendance. Uh, because more often than not, as some of the questions have been put across, and by the way, this is just a comment, you know, around you know, some of the questions that have been attended to seems to uh, suggest that um, you know, can radically, single-handedly, you know, transform this country. You know, I've had um, comments such as, you know, continue the struggle, we are supporting you, we are at your back, we are at your back and all of that. Material point in time, it is relevant for the vast majority of Nigerian people to understand that um, this is not an, you know, you have a terrible state at this material point in time that is really not our collective properties, but also threatening our lives, you know, and the last uh, brother that spoke had just, you know, is dead because we have been told also that, uh, you know, terrorists can, I mean, you can have terrorists as groups, you can have terrorists as individuals, but the point must also be made clearly known that uh, the Nigerian state as it is at this, at this, at, at this, you know, material point in time is also, you know, a terrorist uh, organization. You know, because we are talking about a government, you know, that currently came up with, you know, they came up with a, that we'll be spending 92%, you know, of our budget, you know, to serve this, you know, this country. So what else can we really understand, you know, from all of this analysis of you know, the fact that this, this government, you know, this state is, 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 is you know, We must understand that that um, you know that perspective from 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 the point of view of what needed to be done, and I want to you know on a concluding note state that the question around revolution is extremely important, and I think there is a necessity for us to bring more clarity into it. Um, there can be several variances of revolution, but ultimately when we talk about revolution, we are talking about you know a systemic change must be consistently made, you know. And this system we are talking about is uh, one that would allow the vast wealth of this country to be in the people's hands. We are talking about a socialist revolution. And uh, for some of us, we, we are not, you know, trying to hold back on the basis of what shape this revolution is going to take or what measure is going to bring about it, you know, or what measure is going to, you know, bring about this. It can take different we are, we are not we are not um, trying to be different you know we are not about it. the vast majority of our people understand this you know they say this close the current nigerian state those that are involved members of the ruling class we not relinquish power without without this program this struggle can take it has been exposed the current electoral system of this country is nothing but a fraud uh, you have a scenario wherein even the INEC, cannot even, the INEC uh, person, chair person, you know, cannot even come out clearly, you know, to this from, 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 from the existing political, you know, uh, uh, structure, existing political, you know, uh, party. Dr. Fagmoa, we have to, we have to so, thank. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, thank so, you for your comments, Dr. Fagmoa. Let's take it as a comment. Professor Mwokeji, thank you, Dr. Fagwa. Mwokeji. Can you please unmute him? He's talking, but we can't hear him. 
Okay. Th thank you very much, Professor Falola. Um, I'm glad, uh, Yale, when you addressed the question of uh, elections in 2023 and uh, touch upon the fact that it would be fruitless to hold the election in 2023 under the present conditions. Now, this is what my frustration has been with people when I discuss 2020, when I discuss Nigerian issue and they say, oh, we're going to have an election in 2023, Buhari will go and all that. Whether Buhari goes or does not go, as long as they have this stranglehold around the INEC to predetermine that election. There's no point holding it. Now, you've, uh, you've uh, you know, uh, pointed that fact out. Now, how is it to be done? How is it going to be? How, how, how can we ensure that the election you know, uh, is not held under the present circumstances? See, that is basically the, uh, the issue here, because... Um, okay, G, let me ask you a question as an historian. Yes. So, women been suffer for centuries. So, the Atlantic slave trade, people suffer for 500 years. Even the biblical story of, of um, the mythology of the Israeli, uh, under the pharaohs, they suffer for a long time. So why do you think, we always think that Nigerians will not suffer for centuries? Hmm. That is a good question. I have to say that the fact that uh, people suffered for 500 years, either in the Old Testament, uh, during slavery or whatever, does not mean that it has to happen in our time. And another thing to, to put it in, the con in context too, change used to take a long time before it happens, it happened. But in the present age, as you get closer to our present age, change has happened more frequently so that uh, it, it took, it, how many years did it take the world to get to the Industrial Revolution? Millennia. Uh, 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 you know, uh, millennia. Stay, stay, just hold your thoughts there. Yes. I, I, I like the question that uh, Professor Falola asked, and I wanted to just interje inter inter interject there. Now, you mentioned the mythology of the Israelites and Pharaoh, but also in that mythology, there were certain objective conditions that were given for the suffering to end in 40 days. Mm -hmm. But the Israelites refused to meet those conditions. And as a result, they prolonged their suffering for 40 years. And I see a parallel between us and that mythology, that mythological story. That so with the revolution, we can end our suffering in a year. But without it, we can do it, we can suffer for another century. Why? As if elections are held under the conditions that we're in now, and the way Nigerians are conditioned. Um, they're going to bring in one of them again that would rule for another eight years, minimum, right? And in eight years, you and I will not be in the form that we're in today. You know, uh, and we will not probably be in the generation that will be clamoring for change. And they will be clamoring for the same thing we are clamoring for today. And People will tell them when they complain that, why don't you wait for the election to happen? You know, and then before you know it, it has become 16 years. So 
I think is to look at those conditions and be realistic and honest about what is it can get us to the promised land in 40 days? Mm -hmm. And what is it that can take us to the promised land in 40 years? L I let me apologize to Professor yeah. Woke. Yeah, I need to call Dr. Enna. Thank you so much. I, I think I see, I see Rudolph up there and Dr. he's not getting calls. Dr. Enna. Dr. Enna, are you there? Prof, I said I see a guy up there that you have been skipping. His name is Rudolph. Now, Rudolph, I'm, I'm just looking at the fingers. Yes, Rudolph put up his finger. Rudolph Okonkwo is like... Rudolph Okonkwo, uh, ask your question. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, I commiserate with uh, Amal Esolo on the death of his brother, and um, I thank him for his effort thus far on the issue of Nigeria. But I have a big issue. I do not believe in revolution. Revolutions have not worked in Egypt. Egypt has returned to status quo. Revolution has not worked in Libya. Libya is in diaspora, and revolution will not work in Nigeria. What worked in the United Arab Emirates that they transmitted from an oil and gas economy to a tourism-based economy was an evolution. What Nigeria needs is an economic evolution. And I want to say that COVID-19 epidemic is irrefutable proof that the world is now a global village. And if you see the happenstance in Afghanistan, it tells you there's a micro internal issue to politics and economics and there's a micro. And putting that into perspective, Nigeria currently owes about $83 billion of debt. Of this, about $3 billion is to external funders, big nations like China, and locally about $50 billion. The discourse should not be on power. Even if Omar Yale Sore becomes president today, he does not have the capacity to pay Nigeria's debt ab initio. And you will need to still go back to the table to discuss with these micro macro lenders. So the big question I have to Omoya Lesserwe today is one, Nigeria owes $83 billion. How are you going to pay this? Two, I do not believe in revolution. It can never work because United Arab Emirates, the GDP per capita of United Arab Emirates is about $43,000. The GDP per capita of Norway is about $75,000. The GDP by capital of Nigeria is about $2,300. These countries I've mentioned with a good economy, none of them gone through a revolution. And what am I substantiating this with? Section 14, subsection 2B of Nigeria's 99 constitution says, the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary concern of government. You can only achieve this with economic prosperity. So, so one, APC can be defeated, like APC defeated PDP, because there's a maxim in the United States which says, oppositions do not win elections incumbents lose one we should let buhari complete his tenure because the constitution says it's a single term for four years so i say no to revolution but i say yes to an economic evolution omoya less sorry thank you for your efforts how would you pay nigeria's debt one that's the big question to you this day then two if you say pro people pro people pro people i am not pro people i am pro investment nigeria is not a socialist economy dangote is the richest man in nigeria today is a capitalist so Nigeria is a capitalist economy. So hinge upon that. What is your pro-investment proposal for Nigeria? Thank you. Let's take those as questions. Yes. <clears throat> you are starting from a premise that I have fundamental agreement. You are putting a constitution that was made by military deposits. It's not legitimate. Let's start from there. Our problem is not payments of our loans. It is about people who borrowed the money and what they did with it in the first place. Countries that are doing well do not ask for our kind of revolution. It is countries that have tyrannical leaders, who have oppressive leaders, who have corrupt leaders, who have people who have disregard for technology, progress, innovation even enterprises that needs revolution. Nigeria cannot evolve. It cannot evolve out of a cul-de-sac. You are asking for movement in a country that is perpetually in a state of motion. It's not going to happen until you resolve the problem of those who are the wheels. Now, let's go to the question of your loans repayment, which if I don't answer, you will say, 
I am not an economist and cannot solve Nigeria's problem. The question is, who did you borrow the money from? China, right? What did they do with it? There's nowhere in the world where people lend you money without conditions. There's nowhere in the world where you also borrow without understanding the conditions under which you borrowed. And if these things are happening, there is what they call a, you know, uh, a debt to GDP uh, ratio. That is how much of your GDP goes into debt, uh, servicing and repayment. Nigeria is at almost 90 something percent at this point. So that's not going to work. We can't repay back our loan, except, and what we do, which is acceptable internationally, <laughs> which is not rocket science, is if you cannot pay back your loans because the guys who took the back the loans were not competent enough and may not have looked at the fine prints of the loans you take, you can go back to the people from whom you took the loan that we have a problem. We need a moratorium. And Turkey, the president of Turkey, came into office meeting the kind of condition that Nigeria is now, loan-wise. How was it that he was able to pay back the loans? It was because he went into conversation immediately and said, look, we can't pay back these loans, otherwise our economy will collapse. This is how we want to revitalize our economy. And when we finish revitalizing, you get back your loan, but we are not going to pay you the way you gave it to us because that arrangement was also fraudulent. These conversations can happen at an international level. It happened between Argentina and the IMF before. It happened between the IMF before. So nobody will come and tell me that our only problem is known. No, I am not accusing you of anything, Dr. Enna. But I'm just saying that you can't lump the legality of Nigerian constitution. You can't lump the issues and features that is keeping Nigeria the way it is now, almost collapsing uh, together with how Nigeria is not pro people. And that, you know, um, Dangote became a billionaire because he made investment. Where did he make the investments? Which investment are you talking about? Dangote that built a refinery that is going to collapse this company and got Nigeria, the Nigerian government, the, the people's money. You are not pro people, but when your refinery business is collapsing, you want the people's money, $2.5 billion invested into Dangote's failing refinery. But you don't want to invest $2.5 billion into education because you are not pro people. You don't have a problem giving people's money for individuals to become billionaires and be riding jets, but you have a problem with having pro people policies that will make that will create people who can build Nigeria out of poverty in the future by investment in education, in health. All these countries you are talking about, where I've lived in the last two years in the US in particular, they, they don't, they don't, yes, they don't, they don't tell you that they are not pro people, they are pro investment. It was, that, this, this is like, I just see your Sorry, can I come on? No, Sorry, please, can I come please, in? please. What, what I normally do after the interview, I link the two of you together and you can continue the conversation. I have an important point on ANC. Uh -huh. ANC defeated Appetite. Jacob Zuma okay. is in prison. Okay. Nigeria supported ANC and we became the victims of xenophobic attacks. Omoe oh. Lawyer Soweri, Julius Malema, was the youth leader of AMC. It was patriotic. It was it was patriotic of South Africa. As I speak to you, he has created his own party called EFF, Economic Freedom Fighters. I put it to you this day on this platform. The issues we should be speaking considering Nigeria should and must be economic and it should be numbers. Why the data age? Data is the new oil. If we continue to bastardize people and say the military is bad, Dangote did that. Dangote is our is Nigeria's most global brand. We must promote it. The military was now. bad. We pushed them out. Nadeko was bad. Nadeko was bad. I see why Jutinibu was a Nadeko member. Today is bad. Uh, the politicians are bad. We can't keep replacing people. Let's build the economy. Yeah, Once we build the economy, Nigerians will be Dr. rich. Once we build the economy, Dr. Nigeria Dr. will become like Norway. Dr. Norway. Let, 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 let's, 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 let's not, let's not, 
let's not monopolize conversation here. But when you are making these comparisons, I don't want you to, to run away with the opportunity to confuse people. No. You see, I'm glad you mentioned South Africa sending Zuma to jail. When are we sending Jonathan to jail for committing the same amount of crime or even more than what Zuma did? We are talking about uh, uh, Malema, you know, uh, creating a party. Malema yes. can insult, can Malema can insult Zuma. You saw it on the on the, in the parliament. Insult the president of South Africa at the parliament. He can insult them on the pages of newspaper. He can get on any radio station, any TV station, including SABC, to insult the president. When I called for a revolution and just mentioned the name of Buhari on Arise TV, I was detained for five months, right? And you know, tried and brought before a court for an offense insulting the president. There is no offense like there's no way South Africa will allow that to happen. So you are insulting the president who food. Insulting yes, the president who food. I was detained and charged. Food. Insulting the president will not put food on the table no, of no, Nigeria. No, black South Africans, black South Africans are suffering. I, 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 I came into power and defeated apartheid. They've not improved the lot of the black man. I put it to you this day without. No, no. Which one do we believe of your position? You are you are jumping from uh, South Africa is good. Uh, yeah, uh, this guy is good. And then the next moment when we when we catch you, you jump into another place. So let me. me one-on-one -on -one instead of monopolizing and just ANC was a failure we need to think of how we put food on the table of nigerians section 14 section 2b says the security and the wealth of the people how can we put food on the table of nigerians if you demarket that go to the we cannot sell our criminals when we can't jail our criminals we can't put wait 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 calm down criminals in america Yes, we can put food on our table when the money made for food is invested mm -hmm. in a fraudulent private refinery, 2.5 billion dollars. You can't do that. You are go to the global food. brand. You are, food. You are, you are demarketing. You are demarketing Dangote. So worry, Sarah Reporters is a global brand. I will not de demarket Nigeria. I will not demarket no, Sarah Reporters. We, market. we are telling you that the food made for the people is being diverted into private pockets. That's the marketing now. This propaganda cannot work, my brother. You, when we catch you on uh, one, you jump to your, another uh, one. Doctor, what is the meaning of the marketing? You know, you've made your that, point. Is, is Dangote equivalent to Nigeria? What is the meaning of the marketing Dangote? You've made your point. Thank you. Uh, doc, Professor Tunji Olaupa. Professor Tunji Olaupa. Please unmute him. Tunji Olaupa. Yes, sir. Unmute him. He's talking, but we can't hear him. Um. You hear him? You are hearing me now? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Falola. And uh, I accept my heartfelt condolences uh, for the loss of your brother. And thank you immensely for taking such a huge historical risk on behalf of the future Nigeria. That said, I'd like to just offer a comment. Uh, and this comment is inspired by some earlier comments that you made and how you hugely impressed me on your deep knowledge of the dynamics of revolution that has shaped world history. Uh, but that said, uh, revolutionary conversation in Nigeria had always been confounding for me as a political scientist. And I like to say that in my student days as a unionist, I had occasion to moderate Comrade Olaoni, Dr. Tai Shulari, Ganifai Emi Ayodile, Awojodi Balausman, and I can go on and on. Uh, <clears throat> I, my impression in those days, the Mazdian option was very 
convincing and engaging. But today, some of the talks about a revolution for me raises two methodological issues. The first, which is not, which you are not guilty of, that's a passion without knowledge. You are hugely knowledgeable, but I see a conception reality gap here. Like Professor Ocherno said, the revolutionary theory of change is great at the level of rhetoric, but as an agenda of change, it certainly is more demanding and requires some bit of rejigging of at the level of your practices and your approaches. And here I reference, I reference uh, VI learning tactics that fruition the Russian Revolution, the huge game plan and the coalition of change and a bit of the Machiavellian that he deployed, uh, that saw him indeed leveraging on the wealth of even capitalists to realize what he. So revolution will not just happen because we wish for it. The opposition to revolution is too huge and powerful for you know a social media propelled conversation to me to 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 shift the generality of Nigeria from being agnostic about this conversation. It requires game plan. It requires coalition. I'm impressed with the answers and the positive signals that it gives. I believe that you must begin to rethink the need for some bit of networking, if it's, even if it's a dotted line networking, uh, which the advocates of restructuring, self-determination, and some culprits, even within the current arrangements, you know, given Nigerian complexity, you might need all of this at some level of conversation to create a viable structure that really can engage the depth of complexity that the entrenched interest has built that stand in the way of revolution. Sincerely, I don't want us to remember Shore as one radical revolutionary you know, advocate that we heard of but what that merely, uh, you know, wet us, entertained us. I think we need to get to some level of planning and basics and deep conversation to make this struggle and movement concrete. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me take that as a comment and call Rudolf Okonkwo. Rudolf Okonkwo, please. Thank you, Professor Laupa. Rudolf. Okay. Uh, sure, um, my condolences. Um, on Thursday, I will start um, teaching your former class at the School of uh, Visual Arts, your former school where you were teaching. I will teach them about Bobby Wine, Julius Melema, and I will mention you. And three of you will be in the category of people trying to change Africa. You are very familiar about the political um, post-colonial African history that you taught and you introduced me to the school. I want to know, um, hopefully I'll be able to get you to talk to the students, but I want to know what you will want me to say to these students about your, your mission to Nigeria why you left America to go to Nigeria, what you went there to fight for, and how it connects to what Bobby, Bobby Wine and Julius Malema are trying to do in Uganda and in South Africa. The second question I want you to answer is that I've been following your, all your interviews and all the conversations you've been having. There's one question that people ask you that I'm not satisfied with the answer you've been given, and it's about people who are tired of Nigeria. To the point that they said, we don't want to be part of it. We want to leave. I'm talking about people like Sunday Boho, people like Nam Dekano. And you've been given the answer that if they leave, that the bad people that destroyed Nigeria will essentially be in those, their new enclaves. And because of that, they shouldn't leave. 
is that satisfactory enough to you? And how do you, you see the way I see Nigeria, I see Nigeria say a project, you know, the projects, government buildings we have here, or council flats in Europe. Everybody is in that tall building living there. It's not working, you know, it's in disrepair, you know. Wouldn't you think that it's possible that if Nigeria is, based on the ideas of these people, Nigeria is, people are brought down from that building, that tall, big building that a lot of people are there, and giving small, small buildings around, that some people will make it on their own, that it might be easier that way. How do we, why do we dismiss that option? And, and, and this is what somebody tell, said to me the other day, that Nandi Kano is locked up now. Sunday Boho is out of commission. And he said to me, you people who are against these people, they are not there anymore. You've been saying that they are the reason why you can achieve what you wanted to achieve. Go and achieve it now. They are not active. They are locked up. Go and achieve it. What do you say to these people? Well, thank you, Rudolph. Yes, they're very interesting questions. And um, thank you for keeping my class. When I get back, you are going to lose that uh, position. So you, you should be looking for another job at the gas station where you used to work. Uh, so your first question is very interesting. But I want to say it this way. When I was, uh, when I got a job to teach post-colonial Africa history, I had not got into this level of uh, controversial life, you know, and you and I have known each other for a long time. And we discuss all the time over food, and we joke a lot, design a lot of uh, shows together, we wrote stories, and you know, uh, and what I found out when I was uh, teaching and when I read the text of each of these, you know, post-colonial activists or militants or revolutionaries, is that whatever you are reading uh, or teaching is a fine print of the outcome of whatever the historian or the writer is. You know, I can't even advise you to teach me yet to your class. It would be unjust to the class because I have, I'm yet to completely fully unravel, you know. Maybe it would be better to teach, maybe it's not even your job to teach what I came to Nigeria to do because honestly, a lot of these things happen not because they are planners, they eventually happen, but there's some level of planning involved, you know, uh, secrets involved behind them. Uh, so I won't say more than that. I don't think it's time yet to teach to where as uh, an African. It's having some internet problems there. Why waiting for his internet to get back? Thank you, uh, Dr. Kunku. Ola Itankuka, can you please make your comments? This has been recorded, so he can listen to it after so that we save some time. Allah it on Koka. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Professor. Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, my comment uh, is, I want to first appreciate uh, Mr. Shore. I've been following him for quite a while. You know, right from when he was uh, University of Lagos and all through his career, so our reporters and everything, he's done a fantastic job. But, what does he see about the real issue in Nigeria, which is the defective uh, structure of the country? You know, no matter what happens, if the structure of the country remains the way it is, nobody will be able to make any sense of it. And these are things that people like Aulo, you know, tried, spoke about. I read some of Aulo's uh, books, and you could see that Aulo was hinting at it that there was a problem in the way the, nation, the country was structured. There's a problem with a certain section of the country thinking that the country is their, is their right to rule. 
and everything seems to be tailored towards uh, emphasizing that paradigm. So what, what would uh, Mr. Shore, uh, as, uh, what does he think? Because I don't think Nigeria, to be honest, is a viable entity as it is. It cannot work really with the way it is right now. It's impossible. So, I mean, the revolution, will it be a revolution like Oka, you know, that tried to excise some parts of the country from, from it? Or will he, how is he going to do it? How is he going to pull this off? If by eventual now the revolution works, it gets into power. What exactly, how, is, how are you going to go about it? What are, you, what are going to be your first steps to correcting the anomaly that is called Nigeria right now? Thank you. Thank you. Damilare Drosmi. Damilare Drosmi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to commiserate with uh, Shore also. We got granting the, the fortitude to bear the huge loss. For me, I want to, generally speaking, on a global stage, there is this rollback of democracy globally. And it's not just a Nigerian thing. Even in the US, Rudolph here in the US, I know there are conversations around the issue of state capture, if I may use that word, where corporates institutions have so much control over the states. The Dr. Henny that I spoke the other time, he just spoke the same language of where he sees Dangote as Nigeria. Because for him and his ilk, they believe that Dangote is Nigeria. So you can see a statement, a press statement that says Nigeria exported 10 tons of cement this year. That Nigeria is actually Dangote exported that amount of cement, but they are equating the interests of these corporate elites, the ruling elite for Nigeria. So when he's saying you are demarketing Nigeria, it's because he's not seeing Nigerians, he's saying this ruling class. And it's not a Nigerian thing, it's a global thing. So what I'm asking is because it's not, there's also another mistake where people say, Shoure, how will you carry out this revolution? The revolution is not about Shoure carrying out the revolution. It's all about all saying we are tired of this. I think, how do we put this thing across? One, the executives have failed. They are not delivering to the people. The lawmakers have failed. They are not delivering to the people. And the court too has failed. Because you can see that where they can arrest someone, go to your house without court's warrant and all that, and they will take people to the courts. And the courts will not waste on that process. Rather, will say, go and bring short seat. So that means even the court will no longer deliver democracy to the people. So that means all the institutions of the states, they are failing. But they are not failing because they are incompetent. They are failing because they are programmed to fail. So I think, how do we, for me, if I may ask a question, should we cannot do it? We need to build alliances. There will be disagreements. There will be all this. How do we bring these alliances so that everybody can come to the table and save the country? How do we tell people the right stories? Professor Falola, you're a lecturer. If you go to an average Nigerian university institution, they are highly undemocratic. They only prescribe student union. They don't want people to talk. How do you build people that can actually challenge the system where everywhere you turn to, you are being stepped upon? I think that's the, I don't know whether I should call it a comment or a question. Thank you. Let's take it as a comment so that, okay, you want to answer, please go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yes, I want to. Uh, before I was before Rudolph came on, before Rudolph came on board, Prof. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the professor that spoke prior to Rudolph. I don't know his name. I think you. Know, I, I don't remember. Uh, about, you know, sometimes honestly, I'm humbled by suggestions and comments like that. I have nothing but respect for what he said. We have to build alliances. We have to do strategies. And, but also, he should know that sometimes when these things are happening, they don't come to the surface for announcement. I'm not saying that we've done the kind of alliance or the kind of strategies that meets the standard of uh, the standard he was advocating. Then going to Rudolph. Rudolph asked a very important question about the issue of the self-determination groups. I have never ruled out people having their own countries or seceding from Nigeria. I have been quoted several uh, saying that 
most Nigerians have mentally seceded from Nigeria. So it's not only IPOB or Yoruba or Igboho alone. But what I have consistently advocated was that maybe there is still value in taking on the behemoth or the political class that Mr. Drosimieti is talking about as a collective. That is the self-determination groups, you know, the religious minority group, even sexual minority groups in the country who are all oppressed women could come together and overthrow this system of oppression instead of helping them to break up the problem into smaller units where they can still go and cross you. What I said to some of them are coming to pass. I said, first of all, demolish the federal security agencies before you go and create your own countries, if we need to go there. They said, no, we'll just go and create our own countries, and the federal security agencies followed them. Not only to their various enclaves, they followed my friend, Kanu, to Kenya, abducted him, and brought him back to Nigeria. He's chilling in a federal facility that he wanted to demolish. But what was my advice to him in 2019 before? And I'm not mocking him. He reminds my friend, I go to court on his behalf. I was almost killed during his last court hearing. And I'll keep going back to court because I have a default position on the issue of you know, justice. What happened to him? They brought him back to the same federal court. You know, they brought him back to the same DSS court. They brought him back. Whereas if perhaps per adventure, he had accepted the alliance or you know the stretching of hand that you know that I gave him in 2019, and we had all worked together and taken down a DSS that's the behemoth that can go to anywhere in the world to go abduct human beings and bring them here and created a condition that is discussing at this point a new constitution, new election, a referendum, and including all these great things, items in the constitution. Perhaps it will be easier for you to leave. Now you want to leave, but you are stuck in Hotel California. The building you are describing, Bruder, is Hotel California. You check in, you check out, but you can't leave. That is Nigeria as it is today. Until you solve, until you fire the manager of Hotel California and they shut down that hotel first, you can't leave, even when you check in and you have checked out. That's what Nigeria is. You know, Igboho was a Yoruba nation, but Hotel California staff went to his section of the hotel, shut up his house, killed two people there, and abducted everything they found in, play in his house, including cats. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying, Shore is saying, hey, sir, can we, should we have done the first job of cleaning up the hotel, shutting it down first? I mean, the man, firing the manager of the hotel. And then we can decide when we check out, when we leave, because we paid our bills. But Hotel California didn't let you leave. You know, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, I'm using this analogy. It's a song, you know, it's popular in the US. Hotel California, you know, you check in, you check out, but you can't leave. That is what Nigeria is. And until you break the backbone of the management of Hotel California, sir, you are wasting your time. And it has come to pass. Now, everybody that is asking for self determination has ended up in detention. They are appearing before Hotel California judges. They won't let them leave. Uh, Igboho cannot come back to Nigeria. They cannot leave Benin Republic. You know, even our leader, the Yoruba leader of today, Baba, uh, Professor Banji, had to run out of. Uh, Nigeria is now in Benin Republic. So, but had we taken this next step, had we taken the step that I advocated in 2019 for a revolution, which would have been easy to do with the coming together of Ekano, the Shiites, myself, you know, and the Yoruba uh, self determination movement, calling for a revolution, by now, probably everybody would have been able to go home if they wanted. But I doubt that we'll be going home because this space also has economic value. And don't forget, um, uh, Rudolph, I've discussed this with you before. 
that, which is my own little theory, it's not foolproof, that the way Nigeria is composed today, if Nigeria is divided into six regions or you know, there are countries around it, without addressing the inequalities that brought Nigeria to its sorry state, every other enclave created from Nigeria will be overwhelmed by the poverty of the former Nigeria. In addition to the fact that you will also go to your new homes with rats and they will eat up the foundation, the termites to your new nation. We also eat up the foundation. This is my own little theory. Because me, who used to be the who is the father I would have, I am now being asked to voluntarily strategy and conversations about how we can unite. Can we unite? How can you? Unite with Eurobars. But having issues with this emerging group in the north. First over this years, I also fight. Rudolph lives in a part of New York known as Queens. It's probably more diverse than Nigeria. Rudolph's neighbor is a Jamaican. The person over there is a Spanish. How do you guys get along? I don't ask you, right? <laughs> the reason is that you're living in that neighborhood. When your when your dirt is thrown on the outside, somebody come and carry it. Why would you be fighting yourself as to who has? you know, a smelly uh, garbage. You know, when you walk, you get paid. Why do you want, why don't you start asking for your republic in, uh, in the Queens? Because there's a measure of social justice that meets your expectation as, a, as an immigrant. So, but Nigeria doesn't offer you that. Nigeria has completely failed you. So, and if it's a failed state, the operators of components of it. I don't know, but I won't that so many of the new states see that I don't have a crystal ball regarding the future. But what do we do? I'm saying I want to apply for here in Abuja, I just, I'll just find my way to catch me the Abbey. <laughs> Nigerians, we moved to Biafra, but of Nigerians who would want to move electricity, whereas, you know, everything is just like, ah, everybody will be heading to Biafra. You know, fabled uh, you know the 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 crippled everybody was looking for good. Ninety nine percent not see a dust of gold. Started because people just that's that's why. I just am very, very critical. I'm a 
acceptance of a theory that and prosperity. That's where. Hola, call you to Tola, please. Hello, Rutola, please unmute him. Thank you very much, sir, for the Please, my, like everybody has said, our line and the condolences and deep sympathy. My question is very simple. The name Julius. What would it really be like if and Baba Aye, the spiritual meeting with Julia, some kind of conversation meeting with a, a sepulchre in Nigeria. Somebody told me once, and I have not been able to chew gum. So I'm just one of a meeting between advisor in the name of Baba because Malema because every time I see with the history of South Africa which I know I see an I see the articulation the truth to power and yet Africa is forefathers and all the ancestors African movement are all wondering. And my question is this. But if you have not, what the meeting, how South Africa's Julius Malema and devices meet with an to strategize for a part of some kind of effect on thank you very much sir let, let me say it can that, that will allow me to your turn please unmute sandra yes ma'am Can you unmute Sandra, please? Yeah, we thank can. You. Go ahead. Me, I'd like to to almost um at the same time. I have a few questions. Being an able here in America, the 1800s, that in order for the diaspora, Africa must first, and having been in one of my lineage from to return uh, my question to Omoyele should even pan Africanism is it or uh, is it from you know my last trip Ebos, Hausa, all of the ethnic groups in Nigeria as one people. 
is the brother that spoke before me. Worry, sit down. So, um, doc, um, and there's, I can't think of his name, respect, because it comes together. He has. America currency all dependent upon Africa by I look at someone of foray who's capable of my question to him, Omo Yelish, all these ethnic groups together, how can come together to bring it all together? And I'll take thank you for your time. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prof, can I can I just intervene quickly before? Next, yeah, I just wanted to let understand that the lady that just a popular Nigerian. She's she was the one. She's actually Sandra Isidore. She's for Lakuti to an Africanism. Riots, uh, you know, I inspired fellow on Broadway, which I'm so humble, she didn't want to say it, but so out you <laughs> to thank you so much for coming. That's a big one. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm I'm from the. Uh, uh, thank you for. Um. Free and spread. A, um. This 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 is. Directed to Shore. Uh, and uh, deep respect for what you do. Movement is more political than in the to direct my question to you. And movement reaches out to cells. My question is how this movement can and how could it play its part? I said I wish for you, bro. Sentences, please. Two sentences. Go ahead, please. This is kind of not, I can't. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Yes. yes. Comments, you know, uh, will be very brief because we still have steam people. Yeah. Uh, bring me back to the sixteen people because uh, regarding very average. Go ahead. Uh, yes. So Let's okay. So yeah. the last. Uh, 
how we can bring it to bear. I think it's a very questions around Nigeria, you know, but even in the struggle for America and the USA, played a very important role. And we must, uh, as I said, and use it as a mobilizer. We must also so that our sports people are conscious. They should just not the controversial video uh, recently. The guy who walked into a group of representatives training somewhere in Austria. A country led by terrorists. But Nigerians were divided over go and harass all these young girls. He delivered a very important message that to use sports to fight our oppressors. He called some of these international line with you know the interests of the generality of, of I just want to align with you and I agree with you. We got about bringing Africans together. Men our party is a Pan African movement. Uh, it's, it's part of the reason why of uh, you know secession. African continent should be a country. You know, but I, so our movement's opinion that we have one powerful force. I, I will be glad to meet him when. Uh, not only my level, to me, the African activists who are fighting to take the reward because, well, yeah, uh, like uh, the Pan African, the better for and the fight.
thing.
how she is holding up. And I wonder how your family is holding up. And I say that because I have just been to Nigeria myself and I spent two months. And I know the amount of pressure that my family was putting on me to return just within two months. So uh, I very much appreciate your personal sacrifice. Uh, people have been mentioning this, that uh, you left the comfort of New York uh, and you've shown extraordinary courage uh, in stepping out and stepping forward to the very front lines of the political fight for the emancipation of the people. Uh, this is, for me, uh, the mark of a true leader. In other words, you have demonstrated that you are worthy of leadership of the people. So I wanted to thank you very much for that. And uh, as for the death of your brother, you have turned the occasion of his death into a moment in which you've expressed hope for the country and for the nation. Uh, so this is extraordinary. This is wonderful. You've held up very well, you know, under about five hours of rigorous exchange and conversation. Uh, you've shown your ideas, your competence, and the side of you that I did not know before was the witty and humor, uh, the, the wit and humor with which uh, you took some of the questions. You were calm, you know, under uh, those circumstances. All of that, I think, uh, personal qualities that I appreciate very much about you. And I also come to discover uh, in, in, the, in the space of this conversation that you are not an ideologue. You are not the old leftist, you know, radical, that you are just passionate about practical, positive change in the lives of the people. And you call that change revolution. And I agree with you that there has to be a passing of the baton to a new generation of leaders. And that itself is a, is a revolution that we deserve. And that the likes of Showere, you know, the likes of Mali Ma should be allowed to take off the mantle of leadership. So we know what a man is made of in a time of crisis and what you've done today in taking on this interview has shown what you have, what you're made up of. So I uh, have nothing but great admiration for you, for your cause, for your courage. And uh, I have to also thank Professor Falala for creating this platform uh, that brings us together and takes up some of the hottest issues of the day. Uh, it is not afraid to take on any of these issues and guest, guest after guest uh, is one uh, you know big issue after the other so i i really uh, appreciate that uh, and i um, thank him for putting his considerable prestige and reputation uh, and intellectual resources uh, to uh, the support of your cause uh, i also want to thank uh, uh the interlocutors who have kind of joined issues with you today uh Fabor Ode, uh, Muratunyo Alaka and uh, Moses Ochono uh, for lifting and elevating the conversation with their questions uh I thank also all of the participants who have asked questions uh, and I have to end by just a little piece of uh, my own comment, which is that um, a friend and I were kind of talking about uh, a speech that MKO Abiola gave 
uh, sometime in 93. And it was so rich, it was so insightful. And the question was, oh, was Abiola an intellectual? Of course he was not. But he had a big and diverse think tank of intellectuals that he was working with. Some of the uh, topmost intellectuals of Africa at the time he was very close with them. And I want to encourage you also to broaden the base of your intellectual cohort. I, I know you have a lot of you know, intellectuals like Sean and so on who are working with you, uh, but I, I, I think that that will sharpen and deepen uh, the strategies and the ideas themselves. So I thank everyone uh, for waiting five hours. Uh, once again, uh, this is a Sunday. So uh, whatever is left of the weekend, please enjoy it. Thank mm -hmm. you.